safety incidents yeah. and disability related to snake bite. So we're taking about 41 districts yeah. all over India, and that will be covering 6.37 percentage of the Indian population. Yeah, yeah. This is in 14 states. I think I send you the details sometime. Yeah, you, you, I remember. You are <laughs> just about to start this project. Yeah, you know, uh, the funds came in first week of March. And then the you know we shut shop 23rd of March. Yeah. So we, the money is there with us, but we've not moved yeah. out into the community. Yeah. yeah. Well, the people ready. Yeah. And uh, another minute. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Do, do I need to uh, write a morning picture in my cartoon? Then if you start out with the photo, yeah. <laughs> the, the Diego Armando Maradona. Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> Not because of COVID. No, no, no. He had a heart attack. He was... Recently operated upon, he had a thrombotic stroke in his brain. Oh. So they sort of uh, evacuated the clot and apparently he was doing well and he was uh, discharged from the hospital just a few days back. Okay. All right. Okay. We're just about to start, just give us two minutes. Yeah. Ready? So we start proceedings. Thank you so much. Sheshagri is a speaker. Sanjeev Sharma is a speaker. Shekhar isn't gone to sleep tonight. <laughs> He's just logged it. Shall we start? So we start proceedings on the day three. This is the last day of a conference. It's been, you know, we've got good participation all around and the talks have been excellent so far. And we start showing you this picture of Diego Armando Maradona, whom we lost yesterday. All of us, I, I believe a whole lot of us would be great fans and admirers of him. All with his warts and everything together, but he really lit up a football stadium like nobody else. And that's what Dr. Manju Kini has been doing so far in this field of venomics and biological sciences. Dr. Kini was trained in the University of Mysore. He had training again in Japan and later on in Paris, apparently. And now he's been a long-time faculty of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Singapore. And he's been a regular for most of our conferences, and he's one of the best-known names in venom research the world over. Dr. Kinney, please go ahead. You want to share your screen from your end? Please unmute, sir. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Oh, now we hear you. Good, excellent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming early uh, and listening to my talk. And before I start, I would like to thank uh, J.D. Menon, uh, Joseph K. Joseph, and, and his and the colleagues for inviting me to this uh, annual Snake Bite Conference. 2020. Uh, before we started, I was just uh, talking to Jaydeep, saying that it's not the 
uh, although the program is very good and everything is fantastic, but uh, it's not the best way to have a uh, interaction. Face to face would be the most uh, uh, exciting way to have these conferences. Uh, but uh, circumstances are such that uh, this is how it can be done. And uh, last uh, two sessions, you have heard people talk about uh, number of uh, snake bites uh, and the related deaths and morbidity and mortality and uh, all kinds of details. And some parts are still missing, not clear, uh, at least in the Indian uh, point of view. Um, so, but we all agree that it's one of the uh, neglected uh, tropical disease and uh, we definitely need a better strategy to reduce uh, uh, deaths from snake bite and uh, morbidity due to snake bite. So today I'm going to talk to you about novel strategies for developing snake bite therapies. So as you know, uh, the uh, production of antivenom uh, is done by a very well established century old technology. So what we do is uh, uh, we take, uh, give me one second, yeah. We take the venoms from the snakes and inject into uh, horses, mules, or donkeys, or camels, or whatever. And uh, these uh, produce uh, natural antibodies against the venom. And uh, from these uh, immune uh, uh, animals, we collect the blood and purify the antibodies and sell them as uh, antivenoms which will be used uh, in patients to resolve problems. Of course, it is a serum derived antivenom. And uh, of course, it is a non-human uh, source from where you get the uh, antibodies. And uh, as you also heard uh, previously, they, they have a low therapeutic content uh, of antibodies. There are two issues, one of them is these animals are uh, free roaming. They would have some sort of uh, natural infections uh, like viral or bacterial infections, which may also produce their antibody that might add to their antibody content. And when you are looking at the polyvalent uh, antivenoms, same horses are injected uh, by four different venoms or five different venoms. So you would have a small aliquot of these antibodies which are uh, useful in treating a specific uh, snake bite. And of course, it's an expensive uh, uh, in terms of money. And they have adverse reactions because it is a heterologous uh, uh, serum or antibody we are going to use. So it is complicated further by the fact that there are biological variations. Uh, biological variations, you have heard a little bit about geographic variation, but even without geographic variation, if you have the snakes from the same area also, you'll have the biological variation. For example, uh, all the animals may come from Tamil Nadu, but still Tamil Nadu snakes are not uh, inbred and uh, they have single genomic thing. There is, there will be biological variations in how they produce the venom. And similarly, the horses and the mules will also have the biological variations, which complicate a little bit of it. And this is further uh, enhanced or evaluated through this antigenicity and antibody response in these animals. That varies within the animal because, as I kind of mentioned to you, if the animal is infected during immunization process, it would also have uh, antibody response to other pathogens, virus or bacteria or whatever you have. So basically these three would uh, make the variability quite high, okay? Despite all these drawbacks, antivenoms are the only recommended treatment for snake bite. So we do not have any uh, well evidenced, evidence-based uh, uh, treatment for snake bite. What we propose is, uh, before we do this, let me go back and let you know the inherent drawbacks of these heterologous uh, antivenoms. They're unable to abrogate local tissue damage. This could be because of uh, insufficient pharmacokinetics. 
to reach and neutralize the toxins in the deep tissue. They also have allergic reactions and anaphylactic shock. This is little more complicated because on top of it, we have a medical emergency of snake bite and on top of it, you have allergic reaction and anaphylactic shock. So maintaining or getting the patient out of it is uh, going to be a uh, task for the clinicians. And uh, significant number, five to 56% of uh, treated victims uh, have serum sickness. And uh, as uh, Juan Calviti kind of mentioned to you uh, through his anti-venom research, he has shown anywhere between five to 36% of uh, uh, antivenoms actually are uh, antibodies binding to the snake toxins. And if you look at the toxin neutralizing antibodies, they're even lower than these percentages you're looking at. And further, there is an inability to neutralize snake venoms out from different regions. And uh, um, you know, Karthik uh, kind of mentioned to you uh, in the first session that there is geographic variations and these variations occur in the snake venom because of local adaptation, differences in diet, and also antigenetic differences in the animals themselves. In addition, there's a complex manufacturing process where it depends on the polyclonal antibodies produced within the horses. And the variability comes from two uh, independent biological systems: snakes themselves, which produce the venoms, and the horses and the uh, meals you use for raising the antibody. So to overcome some of these, we proposed a new concept of uh, creating biosynthetic uh, oligoclonal antibodies. These are nothing but a cocktail of human antibodies that target most or all key toxins from the venom. To do this, the first step we need is a very clear cut toxin profile and identification of the key toxins. When I say key toxins, these are the ones which are lethal, which cause uh, death and debilitation. And we have the opportunity now because we can piggyback on the existing technologies of selection, production, and characterization of therapeutic antibodies, human antibodies. And what we need to do is probably for each venom, you may need about 20 to 40 are more toxin neutralizing antibodies to resolve uh, bite from a certain snake. So as a first step, this is the uh, our 21st century approach for genome-based uh, production of uh, antivenom. So imagine that's the cobra or any snake. We look at the DNA and uh, get, get the DNA from them, sequence them and assemble the genome transcription uh, proteomics from that. And we identify the key uh, uh, toxins and uh, develop their, uh, their expression recombinantly and use them to uh, find the uh, phage display uh, libraries when isolate and pan out the synthetic uh, antivenom uh, monoclonal antibodies. These would be uh, actually uh, neutralizing antibodies, not just the binding antibodies. And if you combine all of them, you create a synthetic antivenom or biosynthetic oligoclonal antivenom. So this uh, slide, uh, I'm thankful to Shaker for providing me this uh, picture. And as a first step, we have completed, actually Shaker and colleagues have completed the high quality Indian cobra genome in this January, 2020, and uh, other genomes will be completed soon. So from this, you can easily identify the toxins and develop these antivenoms. What are the advantages of BOA uh, over conventional antivenoms? Their compatibility with uh, human victims, because these are human antibodies. So it's perfectly compatible with the victims. And they're also enriched with only toxin neutralizing antibody. So we don't have just binding or other unwanted uh, antibodies to contaminate them. And because it's all done through a, a well-defined process, 
the quality and uh, reproducibility of this production is much higher and you have a better safety profile. And these individual antibodies, you can change them based on the PK and PD you need. You can have the full length uh, IgG or you can have a FAB2 or FAB and if needed, even make a SFFV, uh, SCFV to make it. Because of these various sizes and things based on what you need for uh, proper PK and PD, you'll be able to abrogate local tissue damage. Because these are human antibodies, we don't have to wait till the uh, uh, victims develop symptoms when they arrive in the hospital. As soon as we know they're bitten by a snake, a specific snake, we can rapidly administer the antivenoms because these are human uh, antibodies. And there will be better acceptance by among clinicians because there is there will be hopefully lack of anaphylaxis. And the question of geographic variations uh, Karthik brought about, you can resolve as I've shown you in the picture here. So you can have a common core toxins, the, the red segment I'm showing as the toxic components and the key components and region one, region two, region three, region four, some of them may have variable number of uh, toxic and non-toxic ones. Of course, we you know, target only the toxic ones to uh, resolve the issues through that. So you can combine specific antibodies, uh, what you need to resolve some of these. And it can also, some of these uh, monoclonal antibodies, they'll have cross reactivity with related toxin from other snake venoms. So because these are human antibodies, there may, there may be a possibility of using them as a potential prophylactic use. And uh, because all of these happens subsequently, once everything is sorted out, we don't have to uh, have live snakes and live uh, snake interaction will be reduced. So that might uh, be also uh, reduce the number of bites for people who are going in the field to catch these snakes. So basically, it provides about a dozen of these uh, advantages over uh, conventional antivenoms. This second development, which, which people have seen in recently, is repurposed drugs as anti-snake bite therapies. Uh, Varus platib and pro uh, drug methyl virus uh, platib, both of them are PLA2 inhibitors. These were actually developed for inflammatory disease and cardiovascular diseases. Unfortunately, uh, their chronic uh, long-term use uh, raised certain questions and poor efficacy issues. Because of that, they failed in the clinical trials against the inflammatory and cardiovascular diseases. However, snake bite is, uh, will be using this if needed as a acute dose and single dose. Hopefully it may not have uh, issues uh, in treating snake bite patients. Of course, it has to be tested in the patients. And the second uh, bunch of uh, molecules are dimercaptopropane sulfonic acid and dimercapto succinic acid. These have been approved for heavy metal uh, uh, poisoning. So they will chelate the heavy metal. And because they can chelate heavy metal, they are very good inhibitor of uh, snake venom metalloproteases. And these SVMP inhibitors have been evaluated in the animals. And of course, in addition to these, there are other molecules which are being investigated. The thought is that you can take this small molecule uh, inhibitor, you mix it with antivenom or BOA to treat the uh, snake bite victims. So you can see some tox uh, toxins may be resolved with just the antivenom alone, or uh, some toxins may require additional molecules such as this small molecule inhibitors that might resolve much better in the presence of the small molecule and the antivenom. So this is the thought for how repurposed uh, drugs could be used in snake bite therapies. There are also other ancillary uh, agents for snake bite. Uh, these are uh, recently uh, uh, one of my younger colleagues, Kempraju, uh, showed that netosis in echis carinatus venom 
uh, is very important. They're responsible for uh, uh, tissue destruction in the animals. So they also proposed that DNA, which is the substrate uh, uh, or which is responsible for netosis when they're released, but this might uh, help as a promising therapeutic molecule. And uh, my uh, other uh, colleague, Vishwanath's uh, group has shown that plant DNAs would also resolve equus carinatus venom induced tissue necrosis and wounds in the animals. And uh, 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 Kempraju again showed that some time ago that melatonin reduces oxidative stress and that uh, is uh, very important in reducing uh, methemoglobinemia in snake bite. This also helps in resolving some of the uh, effects of snake bite. And they also showed hyaluronidase uh, inhibitors, the spreading factor might also reduce uh, snake bite related uh, issues. And quercetin rhamnocide from uh, euphorbia also neutralizes cobra venom toxicity. Like that, there are many uh, components, there are many others which would be useful probably as an ancillary agents, which might help in resolving some of the mortality and morbidity issues. So currently what we do is when the snake bites, uh, the uh, victim is brought into the hospital, that's the first period. This is, uh, we want to keep this as short as possible but there may be monitoring or uh, there may be no or very minimal uh, treatment till the uh, victim reaches the hospital. In the hospital, you have uh, unknown uh, quality of antivenom therapy and uh, very careful vigilance by the clinicians. Uh, they are, they'll be monitoring for the allergic reaction, anaphylaxis and serum sickness, along with the uh, pathogenicity because of the snake bite and you still have high uh, mortality and morbidity. And in the short term or near term solutions, we would think uh, for the snake bite environment, we could add uh, repurpose small molecules such as DMPS or virus platinum or something else. What it does, it will provide a little bit extended time till they reach the hospital. It might help them a little more time uh, available to have uh, reached that. And of course, improve the quality of the antivenom therapy. And that might reduce a little bit of decreased days of vigilance and reduce allergic reactions, anaphylaxis and serum sickness. This probably will help in improve survival with some sequelae and tissue damage. And a long, our long-term solution would be for the snake bite victim, we ha will have repurposed uh, drugs and other new small molecules or nanoparticles or many other sim uh, technology to extend the time required for the patient to reach the hospital. We want to use human monoclonal antibody based an uh, antivenom therapy that would re further reduce uh, uh, decreased vigilance. Because these are uh, human uh, antibody, you can start uh, uh, giving them to the victim as soon as they, uh, uh, they reach the ambulance or the victim is under some sort of supervision, you'll be able to provide this antivenom therapy. This would decrease days of vigilance and with minimal uh, adverse effect. We think uh, we'll have much better survival rate with minimal sequelae and tissue damage. So with this, I've come to the end of my talk. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge people who have contributed. Dave and Andreas uh, helped me write the manuscript which was published on this concept paper. And uh, this was also supported by lots of input by Omesh, uh, Robin, Jay, Priyanka, Gopi, Kempraju, Nishiganda, uh, Sadhanand, and uh, Vishwanath. I would like uh, a special thanks to uh, Shekhar who is responsible to uh, organize this uh, one day event in uh, Jaipur. Uh, and it was a wonderful meet where uh, we could talk to people face to face to come up with this concept. And before I close, I want to let you know, I started my career in studying snake bite uh, issues and uh, using plant components to resolve some of these issues, just to provide a better window 
before they reach uh, the hospitals. And uh, Jaydeep and uh, Joseph K. Joseph, they started this uh, annual snake bite meetings about eight or 10 years ago. And uh, I've been attending almost all of them. And uh, they brought me back to this uh, snake bite uh, issue. I realized how important it is for the victims and their families. I also would like to thank Jaydeep and uh, you know, uh, Joseph for uh, bringing me back and alerting me to these issues. And thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Excellent talk as usual, Dr. Kinney. You've not failed us this time either. A couple of questions in the chat box. There's Dr. B. Murli Dharan, who's, uh, who's accolated your talk. And he, he's asked, since the efficacy of oligoclonal antibodies need to be tested in envenomed victims also, could you please propose your viewpoint on how we can implement this? Yeah, uh, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, we don't use the only oligoclonal antivenoms alone, but probably in conjunction with the uh, our standard horse-derived uh, antivenoms, and we understand how these things would work, and then subsequently you create a mixture which would uh, resolve the sequelae and the morbidity because of the snake bite. So that's the thought. Of course, uh, we will have uh, able support by uh, wonderful clinicians uh, who have been working tirelessly for five, six decades, such as uh, probably David, David Warrell and uh, Joseph K. Joseph and Dilip Punde and, you know, many, many, many hundreds of clinicians are there with uh, their expertise. I'm not going to pretend that I understand how to resolve such issues. Dr. Sadanand Rao has congratulated you on your talk, and so to Dr. George Paul, who's happy to see this contribution from your school, YLL Singapore. Yeah. He's from the HSCI. Ah, okay. If there are, uh, there's one more question from Srinivas. You are preparing the required antibodies from DNA based uh, DNA reference. But as we know, venom variation has a direct link to environmental changes, food, uh, food, etc. And, and that may also be expressed genomically. Many things like uh, I mentioned. So Naya, I want to know how DNA-based antibodies will work and neutralize the targets. Okay. It's an interesting question, but uh, we are not planning to have DNA-based antibodies or DNA-based uh, things. What we are going to do is to identify what are, what are all the uh, venom, you know, toxin profile in that venom. And because of the geographic variation, we'll also look at the other parts to That's just true. selectively uh, use key uh, toxins for the neutralizing using human antibodies. So we've actually pan out the antibodies from uh, the, using toxins. Okay. Uh, la, uh, last couple of uh, comments. Dr. Vishwanath uh, comments that still oligoclonal antibodies have to be developed country-wise or regional-wise. You, you can have one set and region, you may have to add one or two of them. But if it's all of them have been added, it doesn't matter because they are human antibodies. So the total efficacy uh, in uh, neutralizing antibodies might drop from uh, 90%, 95% to 75%. It's not a big issue. So you can use this, say, for example, from uh, Naja Naja, from all four corners of the country, for example. Uh, Priyanka and Nishigandha Naik have uh... Congratulated you on your lovely talk. And Priyanka asked from your perspective, that from Professor Kinney's perspective, when such research could be implemented on the ground level? I mean, on the ground. Uh, well, uh, the process has been started. As I kind of mentioned, we have the uh, Indian cobra genome. We've also started expressing uh, several of these recombinant uh, toxins. 
And for some of them, we have also raised the human monoclonal antibodies. We have panned out the human monoclonal mm -hmm. antibodies. So it's just a matter of time. With, if the good funds are available, we should be able to reach there in just uh, mm -hmm. one or two years. Hopefully, that will definitely make a sea change the treatment of snake bite for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kinney. Thank Wonderful you very much. Talk as usual. Keep the interest going. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we move on to our second talk. And on my right, on the right of the screen is Dr. Shabar, uh, Sabarish. Sabarish and Dr. T.P. Sri Krishnan have been instrumental in getting this conference going. They are the two who have actually worked behind the scenes. And uh, the success of this could be attributed solely to the our work. Sabrish should do the in introductions. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, the next speaker uh, for the event is uh, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma. So the cardiologist and HOD of the Department of uh, Medicine and BP Koirala Institute of uh, Health Sciences from Nepal. Welcome, sir. Dr. Sanjeev. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. And I thank you all. I mean, especially Dr. Men for giving me this opportunity. Should I share my uh, slide from this side? Go ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah, we can see your screen now. I hope this is visible now. Yeah, this is visible. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that some of some of my, I mean, sometimes my internet connection is not good. I'm on data. But anyway, thank you so much for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to meet you all virtually. And thank you, Dr. Chajit Menon, for asking me to present a bird's eye view, I would say, uh, from Nepal. So, you know that snake is a very mysterious thing. And this another issue. And the Hindu mythology, you could see that the snake was portrayed as an poison maker and <clears throat> Lord Krishna has to kill him, kill the Kalina black snake uh, to save people uh, from his venom. Sorry, I could not move my slide. Okay, thank you. We know that the troll of snake bite is very high, and we know that this is an overall background. This one of the neglected, neglected tropical disease. It kills around hundred and thousand people, one hundred thousand people, and more than four hundred thousand people lost their limb or limb deformity. Current treatment, as we know, that are limited. And because of this, especially in Nepal, because of the lack of significant data nationwide, there is confusion how much antivenom to procure and how much to give. Again, coming back to the stress relationship between human and snake, Snake is worshipped as a god and is, is also taken as a protector. You could see that Nepal has a very big phone called Nagapokhari. And with this tall snake there, people worship every Nagapanchami and people go there to worship and king being saved by this. Dr. Sanjeev? Many headed snakes. But Dr. on the other side, many people kill this god snake on site. So there are a lot of almost wow. all snake in Nepal. Let us see how big is the. Long back in 2000, we. Now it's okay. Dr. Sanjeev? Hello? Hello, yeah. Dr. Sanjeev? I think we'll, we'll share screen yes. here. You keep the audio because your audio is not clear otherwise. Did you hear me? Yes. So you, you want me to not to share the slide? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think that will be better because otherwise it's affecting your audio quality. 
Okay, I, I, I'm okay. So, okay. Uh, so we'll share the screen. Okay. Uh, this is the third one. You can just tell us next. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So we just want to wanted to know that how big is the problem of snake bite in Nepal? Next, please. And we want to see in the government record. Next, please government record in long back in 2000. And we could see that there were only 480 snake bite all over the country with 22 deaths. But we knew that this is not so. And even my hospital, there are more number of cases. So we did a study in 10 hospital in Eastern Nepal, where we could see that more than 10 times of government record even in 10 hospital and with more than four times of death. Going back again, long back after 70 years, we wanted to see how many snake bite treating centers or hospitals are there in Nepal and what is the number of cases. But this name remains snake being a very neglected condition. You could see that in Nepal, there were only 81 centers where snake bite were treated. And because the number was there, but everyone is not treating snake bite. And there were 41 centers who treated snake bite and we wanted to look at this record, some record to denote that there is snake bite case, but this record keeping was said to be present only in 20 cases, 20 centers. And even if this 20 centers, two centers did not have anything much. So out of 81, we could get some number from 18 hospitals and the number were eight. next please so we know that this is i think similar situation all around that the snake bite treatment is not a really considered a lucrative one and healthcare provider do not want to say then this is a poor man disease and private hospital with only one exception in Nepal do not treat snake bite unless they need an ICU care where they can put patient in ICU. Lack of appropriate and adequate knowledge to treat snake bite among medical graduates because most of them are graduated from the cities. Lack of facilities in the periphery to treat snake bite, which many a times cause fury of the public and the vandalized hospital. Unfortunately, antivenom reaction is high and lack of human resources where snake bite occurs make a snake bite a difficult situation to tackle with. Next, please. And in this background, we wanted to look at the outcome of snake bite when snake victims reaches hospital. We wanted to see the outcome. And two, you could well imagine that there was more than 58% death in some of the hospitals when there were very low death, 2.8% in some of the uh, um, centers in Nepal, and this is among the envenomed one. And you could see that centers, which is actually run by paramedics, like Damak Red Cross Center, had a low case fatality rate, so also the Charali, and other hospitals where paramedics in the, I mean, army came to the snake bite. So there is wide variation of this snake bite treatment uh, and variation in the outcome of the snake bite treatment in these 10 hospitals in Nepal. Next, please. And at the time when there was difficult to treat, the snake bite victims who were getting difficult to receive treatment, Damak Red Cross started a snake bite treatment center, I would say now. But at that time in 90s, when we started this center, this was like this, where when snake bite patient will start a treatment and they are basically mostly neurotoxic snake, ben ben uh, snake bite, especially the cobra and crate one. And this is how we used to treat the snake bite. And this, this is how we established a snake bite treatment center run by paramedics in Damak. Next, please. Once we started, next, please. Once we established this, then we wanted to know what is actually the burden in the community. 
and why people of snake bite die so much. So we want we did an epidemiological study to see the impact of snake bite and determinant of fatal outcome in southern Nepal. And the, you could see that annual incidence was very high, so also mortality. But I will request everyone not to interpret as a national data because this was basically intended to see the impact of snake bite and determinants of this outcome. It was done in highly snake bite, hyperendemic zone of uh, snake bite. And from this study, what we could get is that someone coming by motorbike and someone directly reaching treatment center and receiving antivenom was a protective factor on the other side, those who went to faith healer or there was a transport delay, they, they succumbed to death. And another important thing from is this study we got was most of the people died before reaching hospital. Next, please. This is what we saw that actually among the death, most of the people, 40% died in the village itself and another 40% died during transportation, meaning that more than 80% people do not reach hospital. So any hospital figure, even is taken, uh, kept as a adequately, will grossly underestimate the impact of snake bite. Next. And after this, we wanted to know that what are the snake that actually in venom people and and our group did a molecular diagnostic tool and morphological study of a snake bite victim and the people who brought the dead snake and found that, next please, the most common snakes are similar in this continent and non-venomous snake constitute the 90% of the bite followed by, next please, next three, four. And we could see that common cobra was the most common snake bite along with common crate. And however, there were some other snakes which we thought were not causing envenomation or at least not recorded in our part or misidentified where bungers nizer, that is greater black clade or lesser black clade bungers lividus. And we also could identify one of, I mean, unidentified cobra. Next, please. Next, please, next. So our group then, after knowing that which are the common snake, a produce a venomous snakes of Nepal, a photograph guide. Next, please. Next. And we know that this actually in the case of neurotoxic envenomation, there was quite uh, significant confusion among snake bite treatment giver because in Nepal, the national guideline recommended, the uh, national guideline that was published in 2003 recommended this initial two vials of antivenom followed by a continuous infusion of the antivenom leading to infusion of very high dose of antivenom in many, pa many patients, in, especially in the crate bite, and there was record up to 250 vials infused in a single patient. On the other hand, international experts' opinion was that they should receive uh, 10 vials initially, and of course that sounds more physiological. So, so we did a randomized control trial to see whether high dose initial versus low dose initials anti-venom in case of neurotoxic envenomation in Nepal was better. Next, please. However, we could see that this dose, whether it is low dose initially or high dose initially, did not make much difference in the outcome, but high dose anti-venom was convenient to give and the total requirement of high dose anti-venom was less. But unfortunately, there was significant adverse reaction related to antivenom injections. And this reactions was seen in 80%, up to 80% in this clinical trial, and 12% of them had severe anaphylactic reaction. I mean, what I'm trying to emphasize that probably the antivenom 
needs to a um, much better antivenom is needed to treat this patient and the treatment has to be available in the remote rural area where people are afraid of infusing such antivenom which can cause severe anaphylaxis and people may die next please next the first day dr giri from shivsagar very nicely uh, presented his his uh, experience on venom induced coagulopathy by pit vipers and i'm presenting these slides because to emphasize that young colleague can make a significant difference in the management of snake bite he was one of our student who completed his internship in our medical school and went to serve far west from nepal where the health facility was really poor and the people used to refer those patients with coagulopathy i mean venom induced coagulopathy in case of pit viper green pit viper and used to refer them and to other center who is of course needless to say that from a remote hilly area they has to come long way to uh, treatment center where they could have received treatment for snake bite what he did is he did not refer all the patient he constantly we make a simple protocol how to do it and all this this important is all patient whatever he Uh, seen this uh, small duration period all patients recover from envenoming on conservative management without administration of antivenom and this was of course a very hot debate while we had a snake bite conference in nepal also therefore i would like to request the colleague that the same as assam experience we also have the same experience here. Here and we do not give. I mean, green pea viper induced coagulopathy. Next, please. Next, please. Next is because we need the snake, which are the snake here. We created a snake by treatment centers. We did a treatment with a randomized control trial guided dose regimen, and now we we are looking at can we prevent snake bite. and snake bite to let a death next please next please and we could many of you know that this is a very simple measure to reduce mortality simple intervention to reduce snake bite and snake bite to let a death we conducted community health educations which help to reduce a snake bite in the rural community and also grossly reduce mortality after snake bite through the use of motor bike as an ambulance next please the two more minutes sir next please another finding from our study was that we can use bed net to prevent nocturnal snake bite which was significant when this bed net was in good conditions and bed condition bed net was less protective than good condition bed net and this has got a renewed interest in now to combine vector borne disease as well as a snake bite prevention probably through the use of bed net you know thank you next please and with incorporation and findings of all this now we have a national guidelines on management of snake bite in nepal and fortunately i could i mean lead this group to develop this and last year we produced a national guideline incorporating all these things and with the criteria of referral and uh, criteria of management in each level of uh, hospital in nepal next please so in this is that preparing nepal where no one should die from the snake bite but having been said so that till now we were concentrating on human death and human suffering but in agrarian i mean agriculture society like nepal or india we did not thought it beyond human resources however i mean human uh, death or mortality however we know that many of our people in the rural community depends on the 
livelihood and animals for their livelihood for revenue generation and many of them as a food next please therefore there is a new look and we are trying to look at snake bite infliction on both human as well as animal health and trying to look at what is the implication of this snake bite in animal health or animal as a protective or risk factor i'm uh, in in case of snake bite to human next please so this is a snake bite now with with looking at this animal loss human victim and cause related to all this corners and and for this we have done a nationwide community based study with an epidemiological study which who also prioritized this next please so this is the group this project is known as snake bite project you could see that b y t e y is not a spelling mistake but it's a it's a symbolization of digital component of this project and tackling this second deadly entity predicting and reducing the impact of snake bite on human and animal health through interdisciplinary analysis of hot spot and access to care as it started in march 2018 and we are halfway now completed and this is occurring in nepal and cameroon and this is completed the field survey and data being analyzed now but what could i tell you from the very preliminary uh, result is the snake bite victims number of snake bite victims are very high with around 160 64 cases uh, per 100000 with 20 death per 100000 and similar numbers also recorded in case of animals death also in case of animal envenomation the outcome was mostly death of that uh, animal next please next please i thank you for your kind attention and i thank once again the organizer for allowing me to present in this wonderful forum about snake bite in nepal thank you very much thank you sir it was a very insightful session you yes. check whether there are any questions Stop sharing. If uh, Priyanka started, come down. Priyanka, only one. Come Priyanka. Yes, Priyanka, dear Dr. Sanjeev, wonderful seeing you here. Thanks for your presentation, which is uh, more or less the same story here in India. So that's message from Priyanka. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Priyanka. Yes, we are in the same boat. <laughs> uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm Professor Shumnath from Kolkata. I just want to know what is the result of the RCT that you had conducted. I was not very clear about the result that you got in the RCT that you are talking about. Yes. Yeah, actually, we did the RCT to see that whether initial low dose, that is two vials, versus uh, high dose, ten vials, and there was protocol. It's already published both protocol and the result of this study. And what we could see that the requirement of antivenom outcome was not different in the both arm. But what was seen that giving initial high dose. antivenom which is a protocol as now in most of the countries in our region uh, is very convenient for the caregiver and what we could see also that there was very high prevalence of uh, adverse event related to antivenom and another important uh, observation we could made from this study was that in case of great envenomation the requirement of mechanical ventilation was very high it was actually 58% people, people with great bite require mechanical ventilator support yes,
Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. Excellent talk that. So we will continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So we will continue with the remaining uh, sessions. Uh, we have made a very good beginning. But before that, uh, I would like to mention a few words about uh, very active organizers behind the scenes. Uh, to my left is Dr. Sri Krishnan, one of them. And uh, earlier you saw Dr. Savarish who was sitting there in the seat where now Dr. Jaydeep is sitting. Both of them very, very active and uh, incidentally happened to be my students. <laughs> and in spite of what uh, I taught them, they have become really good professionals. <laughs> That's of course a joke, <laughs> hopefully. So Dr. Sri Krishna and Dr. Sabrish are the prime movers of this conference, besides, of course, Dr. Jaydeep, uh, who's been leading uh, the entire uh, you know, process, and also Dr. Girish. Uh, I may mention uh, at this stage that Dr. Sri Krishnan, Dr. Sabarish, uh, Dr. Girish are all important office bearers of the Indian Society of Toxicology, which is now headquartered here in Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences for the last 15 years. And in fact, we are planning uh, a national you know, conference uh, online, uh, perhaps in a month or so. Uh, that will be, if I recollect correctly, the 14th conference of the Indian Society of Toxicology. We will be keeping you all informed. So let us move on to the next talk, and that is by Dr. Somashekar Seshagiri. He is the president of Sci Genome Research Foundation India and the CEO of ModMap Therapeutics and Antler A Therapeutics California USA. He will be talking about something that has already been set in motion earlier by Dr. Manjana Kinney who talked about novel strategies for developing anti-snake bite therapies and touched upon genome-guided antivenom development, which will be taken forward now by Dr. Somashekar Seshikri. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, let me uh, share my screen and hopefully, uh, let's see. Okay. So hopefully uh, you can see my slides. Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Jaydeep uh, and uh, Dr. Joseph and, <laughs> and colleagues in uh, Amrita Institute. I had the pleasure of visiting uh, your institute a couple of times in the past, and uh, I have some uh, deep collaborations with some colleagues there. Um, so today, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you about our sort of work uh, in the field of antivenoms, and it's more of an accident rather than um, something that I do for sort of a living, um, it's more of a hobby, but uh, fortunately it's a, it's a fun one. So let's uh, dive straight deep into it. Uh, and um, let, me, uh, let me start by saying, uh, snakes are amazing. They've been on the planet a uh, lot longer than we have been, a hundred million years and humans have been there only about maybe 150, 200,000 years. And um, in the process, uh, uh, you, you know, snakes have uh, uh, gone to every uh, continent uh, except maybe Antarctica. Um, there are over 3,400 species of snakes, uh, give or take maybe a few more or less. Um, and they are phenomenal evolutionary success. They're lizards that went underground, lost their limbs, and, and uh, some, a small number, developed a uh, venomous uh, uh, arsenal to catch their prey. Um, they're amazingly uh, beautiful, uh, and, and uh, we have an obligation as the late occupants of this planet to protect them. But of course, it's not their fault that we're getting bitten. And uh, that is to do with the fact that, you know, there are 8 billion of us on the planet. And of course, we made sure there are enough chickens to eat. There are 24 billion of them. And uh, the snakes, uh, if you use any of these denominator, I would imagine uh, there'll be many, many orders of magnitude smaller in, in, in the numbers they are. So uh, the conflict between snakes and humans is uh, really something that humans have created. Uh, and so no point in despairing, uh, saying that we're getting bitten, but rather try to find a solution to the problem. And of course, Kinney touched on this, and this is actually on your left is the first paper uh, published uh, by Albert 
Kelmet, uh, when um, you know he worked as part of the Pasteur Institute in uh, Saigon and Vietnam, where they developed the first anti venom against uh, the Indian cobra, in fact. And the process on your right on the top here, 1892, you extract the venom, you immunize the horse, collect the plasma, put it into a vial, and, and give it to patients. That has not changed between 1892 and 2020. And you would agree uh, that the fact that I am sitting in San Francisco, I am talking to you, uh, probably uh, you know miles and 9,000 miles away in India and other parts, uh, is possible because the world and the technology has evolved and the science has done wonders. But the anti-venom field and the whole study of venoms has kind of crawled and not kept pace with the development of the technologies. Of course, snake venom, I don't need to tell this audience, I'm, uh, I'm an outsider, as I said, I study cancer and signaling and do drug development stuff, but the, this has been a fun project for me. Um, it's a complex cocktail of proteins, you know, 50 to 200 components, proteins, lipids, enzymes, peptides, only some of these are toxic. Uh, and venom is not as bad as it looks on the surface because they're amazing templates for drugs. In fact, uh, uh, yeah, you know, at the Amrita Institute, I'm sure you, you prescribed catapril to many folks for blood pressure. And it came from Brazilian uh, pit viper. It's a derivative of uh, the uh, venom component of Brazilian pit viper. Um, and uh, of course, what we do in terms of uh, doing, developing the anti-venom, uh, we're taking uh, crude venom, the composition of which is not well known, uh, not well defined as uh, Kinney alluded. And uh, we simply extract that. We put it in a horse, hope and pray that the horse will make all the right antibodies against the right things that you need to neutralize. And then we bottle it up and, and we give it to patients. We've been doing it for hundred plus years. And the horse makes its own antibodies. It gets a cold, it gets a virus of some kind. It's gonna make its own antibodies. You get that too. And these are all what people were talking about before me of adverse reactions and other things. Imagine if you went to a, a, a pharmacy and, and you bought aspirin and you didn't know what was in it. Uh, that is exactly what is going on with anti-venom, partly because the whole industry of trying to develop anti-venom has stayed behind and not kept with technology. Fast forward in 1920s, uh, you know, this, this technology is 1800s, 1850s. Uh, 1920s, uh, insulin, if, before 1920, if you were a diabetic, it was a death sentence. 1920s, people started making insulin uh, and uh, you crushed the pancreas from slaughterhouses from pigs, you bottled it up, you purified the insulin, you gave it to patients. And still, uh, this is a big advance. And unfortunately, the anti-venom field is, is not even there uh, or maybe close to it if I was kind. And of course, the whole thing changed in the 1970s when the insulin gene was cloned, be commonly produced, and no longer diabetes is a death sentence in, in the sense it was uh, uh, in the prior to the 1920s, prior to World War I. And monoclonal antibodies, antibodies uh, have been around, they have been turned into drugs, and that's exactly what antivenoms are. But the antibody drugs that today that are given to treat cancer or many, many of the immunological indications, they're well defined. You know what's exactly in the vial in the bottle and what, what is it targeting? So you can actually treat patients with some level of confidence as a clinician and not do this entire thing as a guesswork. And the reason this is not caught on to uh, the antivenom field in the context of snakes is there is simply uh, uh, not the money needed and also, uh, I think uh, uh, simply the whole field has uh, stayed doing things from the past and not looking forward. And uh, I'm going to argue that uh, you know, uh, inside our genome, in, in our DNA, is our entire blueprint. You, we all start as a single egg and become complete humans. So does a mouse egg, so does a, a, a seed of rice and a snake uh, egg, a fertilized egg. And literally it has the blueprint, understanding that blueprint, getting that code can do wonders. In fact, that happened with the technology of DNA sequencing at Sanger 
uh, that was invented in 1977. He was the first to actually sequence a protein and later sequence a DNA and get two Nobel Prizes. And the Human Genome Project figured out the, uh, uh, the contents of each of the 23 chromosomes. So we know the sequence from end to end of each of these, and they're about three, three times 10 to the nine base pair, three gigabases. And it costs us uh, close to about $3 billion to do. Of course, uh, that was uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. And technology in terms of sequencing costs has come. We can produce a lot more data. And the Human Genome Project investment of $3 billion in about 2013, the estimate was you got over 300 or $400 billion in return because we were able to accelerate human uh, uh, disease management and, and research and drug development so much, much faster than ever before. And today the cost of sequencing has come down. There's no reason to kind of sit and watch. Uh, yes, it's a challenge uh, in terms of studying other organisms, but it's also an opportunity. What we did was we asked, can we take the sequencing technology and apply it in the context of medically relevant snakes and try to get its blueprint and in the process build what is actually going into the venom and not uh, do a voodoo science where we keep guessing what is in there and, and being able to get at the code that will allow us to actually understand and define the components of the venom and, and then turn it around and use it to develop anti-venom and maybe the data from it can also help with drug development. So the journey started a number of years ago when I uh, contacted Kinney in about 2013, when he and colleagues uh, had published the King Cobra genome. And I said, Kinney, you're from India, why not an Indian Cobra? And Kinney was uh, in his uh, polite manner said, hey, why don't you get the sequence and I'll help you after that. Fast forward, uh, what you see on the left is actually uh, the, the snake that's ended up on the cover of Nature Genetics that's being uh, the, the uh, uh, one that's being shot uh, in, uh, you know, with a camera uh, in uh, actually the crocodile uh, park in Chennai uh, last November. As my colleague in the paper, Kushal, it's our field lab. This is in Kentucky where they have over 200 Indian cobras were collecting some blood to do this uh, work. And this was a phenomenal opportunity to collaborate with many people across the world. I go between India and the United States very often, prior to the pandemic, but uh, of course life has changed a little bit and hopefully we'll all get back to normal. Um, and I live uh, uh, in, in two parts of the uh, world. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, and I have a number of collaborators in uh, a Slade in Kentucky, a number of people in Cochin where the foundation is in Bangalore, Kinney in Singapore, and my colleagues in uh, Japan. So I'm not gonna read this, and, and uh, I think you guys know more about the Indian Cobra than I do. And uh, when I lived in India, I've seen a number of them. Uh, they're, they're amazing uh, and uh, revered as well, as much as feared. Uh, and uh, it was a fascinating thing for me to study, to understand its blueprint, and, and also figure out what is actually uh, in the venom gland, what, what is the code that uh, makes the venom? So we started by developing the karyotype. This is uh, the chromosomes from the Indian cobra. It has 18 autosomes and the Z and W, unlike the humans, X and Y. So there is 19 chromosomes in total. Um, in fact, a paper from India in 1971 had reported the same. We merely confirmed it actually with collaborators from Texas. And we developed a technique to actually isolate single chromosomes and apply new sequencing technologies to actually get at the sequence. We collected a number of uh, different types of sequence data. I don't mean to bore this audience other than to say the world of sequencing has evolved and it's possible for anybody to collect sequence data and actually do this type of stuff. We collected short read data from alumina, long read, very long sequences using a, a nanopore sequencing technology and, and uh, packed by uh, single molecule sequencing and collected some data on uh, chromatin um, interactions, chromatin DNA interactions that, that uh, give you the spatial context of how the DNA is organized and, and that can be used to uh, assemble the genome back. And uh, there's another technique called optical mapping uh, using BioNano that, that we also apply. Uh, or we took all of this data, when I say we, my uh, colleague Kushal uh, actually took all of this data with, with other colleagues and wrote a bunch of computer programs that used other algorithms that were developed by other people in the community and started stitching all of this data to create a contiguous uh, genome. And, and that's, that's what these two slides are illustrating. 
the end result of it was the most complete chromosomal assembly of uh, any genome for that matter. I told you there are 19 chromosomes. The idea was we wanted to get the sequence the end to end in this uh, the DNA, the four alphabets arranged in linear order. And we managed to do that just almost. And uh, uh, there are other statistics here I don't want to bore you with, but this is basically the chromosomes going from, uh, you know, uh, you, can, uh, you can see the numbers on the top on the edges, and there are a lot of other features and microchromosomes in here. And uh, then we take this and uh, we use computer algorithms to analyze and figure out what are the protein coding genes. At the end of the day, majority of these things that happen in our uh, uh, cells are the results of proteins. And uh, you heard from Juan and others who said proteins are the most important, no doubt. But to get to proteins, you need the code. And if you get the code, the source code, so to speak, you can do a lot of things. And the Indian Cobra genome codes for roughly about 20, 23,000 protein coding genes. Uh, the human genome roughly codes for about the same amount of uh, genes, maybe give or take a few more or less. And this is well within the numbers of other snakes where the genomes are not as contiguous. The most important thing is being able to get a genome that goes from one end to the other as much as possible in each of these uh, chromosomes, because then you can get a complete gene structures and you can do a lot of things with it. So we took all of this data and uh, we started after annotating the genes, uh, we started asking how are the uh, protein coding genes, particularly the toxins organized in the genome. What you see here in each chromosome, the various toxins that are probably relevant in the context of uh, the venom glands and, and the venom components and they're annotated here and some are expressed only in the venom glands. And the way to figure this out then, now that we had the genome, we did what is called an expression body map. We took a number of tissues from uh, the snakes and then we collected the RNA data. The RNA is the interpreted component of the DNA that, that then is turned into protein. For example, you have an insulin gene, an insulin RNA, and, uh, and the corresponding protein. And, and so uh, we, we got that data and we can figure out what genes are actually expressed only in the venom glands. And that's this exercise. And we defined what is called a venomome. And from a set of about 23,000 protein coding genes in the venom glands are about 12,300 odd that are expressed protein coding genes. Of this, about 109 are highly enriched and 139 have signatures of what would qualify as a toxin from what prior knowledge we have. And of this, about 19 are specifically only expressed in the venom gland. And, and these we called as uh, the venomome specific toxins. These are the 19 things, if I were to pick and target today with an antibody to develop an anti-venom, I would work on. And uh, out of these 19, I just wanna point out the Indian Cobra, obviously, I don't need to tell this audience, it's highly neurotoxic, the venom is neurotoxic. So we identified six venom gland specific neurotoxins, two uh, cytocardiotoxins, one uh, muscarinic toxin, and there are other SVMPs and other stuff. And that's what you see in here. What we were trying to arrive at was the minimal venom gland specific genes that an anti-venom should target in order to at least uh, be an effective anti-venom. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create the parts list. And if you were a Cobra and you were to go out and look it up and say, hey, you know what, what, what should my venom gland make uh, in, in the reverse perverse order? Uh, these are the things I would make if I were a snake. And that's on the top here. In the bottom, there are accessory proteins that, that the venom gland also has. They help in protein folding and doing a number of other things as well. Uh, so uh, the point here is having defined this, and, and I, I, I you know, have to say, I'm just kind of reminding you the old way of making anti-venom. That's still the, the default method or lack of better ways of doing this. And, and that's perfectly fine. And I don't think uh, we're gonna radically change this tomorrow morning, but at the same time, we gotta take the baby steps near to kind of move this to the 21st century, which uh, Kenny um, shared the slide. And the idea here is we have an opportunity to spare the horse and also spare the snake. We don't need to go keep isolating venom from snakes. And uh, you'll be able to get the, once you have the genome, there's sufficient methodologies established in the field over the last 30 years or so to make recombinant toxins. And you can produce uh, 
the uh, antibodies using phase technology, or you can go to a mouse or horse at that point to develop antibodies. And uh, you can synthetically express and reconstitute in venom. And in this vial, you actually will be able to tell what is in there and exactly what antibody reacts to what, what uh, snake toxin and not uh, the guesswork anymore. And in fact, the previous uh, speaker, Dr. Sharma said, you know, you're giving so many vials of this antivenom. I would bet you wouldn't have to do that uh, if you had a synthetic antivenom. And of course, the, the counter argument to all of this is, you know, the variation among snakes, the number of different snakes, all that is true. Uh, and in fact, if the Human Genome Project thought about this and, and, and uh, paralyzed on part of doing the, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis analogy, we would never be where we are today because you take humans, there is sufficient variation, there are so many differences, yet you got to start somewhere. And this lays the foundation. And in fact, you can build on as, as Kinney said, uh, you can build as many antibodies and you can keep adding to this vial. And yet it still will be a defined component and it can maybe start with a, a regional um, problem of a cobra uh, and then expand within cobras then expand to other elapids, and then maybe start thinking of uh, other uh, vipers and, and larger uh, families of snakes. So what uh, we've done so far, completed sequencing of this one um, iconic snake, did a chromosomal assembly. It was, uh, you know, just to give you the sense of uh, the amount of work that went into it. The Human Genome Project took 16 countries and uh, uh, have $3 billion and tons of people. Uh, obviously, you don't need that today, but still it's a large amount of work. And we, we were a very small team, but I'm very grateful uh, that uh, we had some excellent people that we were able to leverage uh, and, and complete this. And, and particularly, I think Kushal deserves a lot of credit. Uh, we have now what, what we think, and at least in hypothesis of what we should target. And uh, we have started expressing some of these in different uh, systems recombinantly. And our genome has already become a template for a number of other interesting things. Uh, you know, obviously, I told you snakes have been around 100 million years. A lot of evolutionary stuff that we can do to understand um, the, the evolution of life in general. You know, why, why do snakes don't have legs? Uh, how come snakes are not susceptible to their own venom? There are lots of things, and we've done some parts of that. And of course, uh, this uh, database of uh, venoms are the most uh, under um, leveraged because nature has perfected these venoms and they affect physiology of uh, whether uh, you know, it's rats or humans. And when a snake bites, uh, your blood pressure drops, uh, uh, your, your blood doesn't clot or sometimes it clots. It, it intercedes in natural processes and you can turn around uh, that physiology and, and turn them into drugs. And some have been successful, but there's a lot that can be done. So I'm gonna stop here and I, I have a lot of colleagues to thank in particular Kinney uh, for uh, actually uh, you know, spending his entire time studying uh, toxins and stuff. He and I have um, a robust argument about you know, the field and, and what's not happening. Uh, and, and we agree to disagree on some stuff, but uh, he's been a great colleague and uh, uh, a friend uh, who's kind of pushed the field in many ways. And I told you about Kushal, uh, he, uh, he is, apart from the snake, uh, he is the other hero in the story. Kristen uh, at uh, Kentucky Reptile Zoo, uh, you know, we were collecting samples and, and uh, there was an intern holding a snake and uh, she fainted and it was kind of a drama there for a few minutes because this was a very big cobra uh, that we were uh, dealing with. And so, uh, I, I mean, I'm greatly indebted to her for, for a number of things she did for us over the years. And of course, colleagues at uh, Cochin and Agri Genome, the Kerala Forest Department, Arun in particular, who has been uh, a phenomenal supporter, and, and some of the colleagues in India for generating the sequence there and sharing with us. And of course, uh, colleagues at uh, my former uh, company, uh, Genentech, my colleagues at Texas, uh, of course, all the graphics for Allison, the Bionan, and Dowtail. And surprisingly, this was not something we had expected when we published this paper. Uh, it got a phenomenal amount of attention, and, and, and I don't mean it as a sort of a, something that I want to uh, uh, kind of get. Uh, I'm very happy that this problem is getting the attention, the neglected tropical disease, and the idea that uh, this is a problem. And, and it's no longer that uh, India does not have the money to invest in it. Uh, there are many uh, uh, phenomenally wealthy people, and, and I think it's an important uh, social problem and people need to make an investment. I know Priyanka and many other colleagues 
are pushing the limits there in terms of making awareness. And so I'm very grateful to many of the press that gave us the opportunity to spread the message. Um, so I'm going to stop here and, and uh, Jay, I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Somashekar, for that very fascinating presentation. Uh, and uh, we are very happy to see all the kinds of advances being made before we you know, see a situation where we have effective uh, anti-snakebite uh, you know, strategies aside from anti-venom. We have a few questions in the chat box, a couple of questions sure. actually. One is from Dr. Vishwanath who says that since we know the genome sequence of COBRA, does all COBRA and Indian subcontinent have the same genome or do we find polymorphism? If so, do we find polymorphism in the COBRA venom gland? That's from Dr. Vishwanath. Yeah, uh, Vishwanath, uh, my answer is, I think I tried to address it right at the beginning. Uh, yes, these are wild animals and they're not inbred, right? It's not like uh, uh, if, if, you, if you went to Kerala and you took a community of people, uh, you know, the Nyers, Minans, and you sequence within a community, you're going to be identical or, or very close. But uh, then outside of that, it's going to be a little different. Yes, there's going to be variation. But like I said, you know, the first human reference genome by no means is, is, the, is sort of representative of all of humanity, but it's as close as it gets to start. So we'll get to that, right? We'll be able to address this variation. We'll be able to address, uh, uh, you know, the three finger toxins if you take, it's a scaffold and nature doesn't uh, uh, change this too often. And, and so, uh, yes, we'll have to sequence more, but you know, I told you the first human genome was $3 billion to get the next one is only about a thousand dollars. So, We'll be able to address this vari address the variation, get a lot more uh, uh, data, but we got to start somewhere. So let's not, as a community, get paralyzed in this notion that the variation is the most important thing, and we need to focus on that. Yes, I, I am happy for people who want to focus on it. Great, please do. But you need people like me from outside who come with a different thinking and say, "How do we solve this problem?" And I'm saying we got a genome. Let's start producing some antibodies that are defined and create an antivenom. Either it works or it doesn't work, we'll know. But the chances of it not working is not any less than what's being done today. That's my, uh, my argument about it. Uh, all right, all right, there's one more question. I get a couple more actually. This particular question I'm referring to is from uh, and Joe. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I have a feeling that I'm not. Apologies for the same. Uh, he says that, um, you know, any idea of the number of toxins per venom that need to be targeted to neutralize the whole venom toxicity? That's one question. Uh, then he goes on to add not only lethality, but how many antibodies per toxin would be needed to block the toxicity of that molecule? and cost of synthetic antivenoms. I hope you got all the questions yeah. Uh, clearly. Yeah, I did, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll address the first one. So at least in the COBRA, we think it's 19. And I honestly think it may not even be that many, partly because you know each of these is injected at a certain level uh, and, and you want to uh, uh, block the most potent uh, one. In the context of horse antibodies that you get, you have no, you have some idea but really, uh, how do you know how many neutralizing antibodies are there against each of these uh, toxins? Uh, and half these toxins are not even well characterized. So at least we're starting with an hypothesis here, one. Uh, then uh, in, in terms of number of antibodies, yeah, Kenny was saying we need two. I'm gonna argue, I, I am happy to take one because you know what, once the toxin binds because you're treating a patient after the fact that they're bitten with a snake, you're not neutralizing the venom, uh, you know, uh, in the field. Uh, so if you had a good antibody and if you understand how antibodies work when they bind to a toxin, they recycle the toxin. They basically shuttle it. They bring it into lysosomal destruction. So uh, the idea of, uh, you know, there's on and off chemistry as well, you know, the binding thermodynamics of protein interactions. So I, I would even think one would do, but maybe two, but it's, uh, it's still very doable. And, and, uh, I, I would say anywhere between 10 to 20 toxins and two antibodies per toxin, uh, you're gonna get a super duper antivenom, I think. And, and uh, you know, you move away from elapids, you go to wipers, probably you'll have to ta target a lot less. Uh, you know, you target the hemolytic and uh, uh, you know, things that like, cause all the bleeding and stuff, right? They're much, much 
smaller set of things you have to target, whereas the Elapid seem to have created a much bigger arsenal. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Sambhashekar, for uh, right. you know, all those clarifications and for a very interesting presentation. But due to time constraints, I'm afraid we cannot take any more uh, questions. Uh, and we will move on to the next uh, presenter uh, and the next presentation. Over to Dr. Sri uh, So the next uh, session uh, will be by Dr. Dhirubhai C. Patel, sir. He's an MO general surgeon from uh, at private hospital Dharmapur, Sri Shanti Surgical and Maternity Hospital, uh, Walsar, South Gujarat. His key area of interest, he has been treating snake bite patients since 1987, doing snake awareness program in the community and college schools, identification of snake occurrence incidents, prevent, prevention of bite snake con uh, conservation, and doing many social activities. Awarded by the government of Gujarat, IMA Gujarat, and so many trusts. Uh, his main area of interest will be training of snake rescuer, training for treating doctors, and awareness program. Over to you, Patel, sir. Patel, sir, can you just uh, unmute and we can start? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Huh. Good afternoon, everybody, sir. First of all, I am very heartful, uh, thankful to Dr. Respected Dr. Joseph, sir, and Dr. Menon, sir, for giving me opportunity to hear, uh, appear here. Sir, I will uh, present someone, Russell Viper case next. See, sir, M45 had Russell Viper bite while going for urination at 8.30 p.m. on 7, uh, 27 December uh, 2019. Patient observed tooth at bite side, pick up and removed himself, brought to us. Patient first at, attended at CSC level hospital from where immediately referred to district level hospital. At district level hospital at 10.15 p.m. on 27.12, Patient admit, admitted where the ptosis and hematemesis noted pulse 76 and BP 90 millimeter of mercury. Injection ASV 8 while given and antibiotics AV hydrocortisone atropine neostigmin. Whole night patient remained uneventful. In the morning at 9 a.m. on 28 December, patient had massive bloody vomiting and sudden cardiac arrest. Sir, the bleeding you can see Bleeding you can see in mobile, uh, those doctor who has shown me. Patient, patient intubated and resuscitated, treated with tenexa, vitamin K, dopamine, hydrocortisone, more 10 while ASV given there in normal saline, referred to us with uh, again 10 while, so total number of 28 while ASV given. Patient referred to us arrived at 10.45 a.m. on 28 December. Next. On admission, you can see the condition of patient. Next. Next. Next, sir. At the time of admission, patient was on ventilator support, SPO2 for few time not seen, then remained around 40-60%. At the time of admission, patient had severe bleeding from ET tube, Pulse BP not recordable, bloody froth from the ET tube. Here we, uh, in between 10.45 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., completed CVC in right internal jugular vein, injection noradrenal in 7 ml per hour, more 20 vial of ASV given, rice tube contained blood clots and bloody thick fluid, stomach was given, injection hydrocortion 3 vial given, total 50 vial anti ASV given. Next, sir. We are managing CVC and this thing we are giving stomach was here, sir. Next. You can see, sir, uh, bleeding in rice tube also and in kidney tray. Next. Few times spontaneous respiration, then again respiration stops, so put on ventilator. Police scatter contain clear urine 300 ml. Patient's general condition gradually improved. BP 130 by 80 millimeter, millimeter mercury, SP to 99%. Patient had spontaneous smooth respiration. Patient become conscious, follow verbal command. So I, I was very happy. After some, what happened after 11 p.m. patient had started worsening 
first spo to fall down put on assisted ventilator sub consciousness lost next sir respiration bilateral arrangement clear till now after 3:30 am bp fall down and at 6 am sudden cardiac arrest and patient expired next sir this is the investigation hemoglobin and platelet was normal on 28 december 151000 creatinine was 2.6 mg per deciliter on 28 december at 5:20 pm platelet down to 58000 At 8 p.m., platelet was 24,000. Next, these are the p.m. finding massive collection of blood in pleural cavity, severe blood coming out while exploring chest wall. Both lungs dark and blood in the lung, uh, blood in stomach also. Mild clear fluid in peritoneal cavity. Both kidney mildly swollen. Next, see you can see the blood in thoracic cavity and lung full of blood. next is the pm findings why death asc may not be effective vicc dac conclusion patient did not waste time taken medical treatment promptly medical treatment was given according to the protocol patient still died like such cases more research require on the venom of russell viper we give 7 units of ffp 3 units of rcc sir next ओके सर केस इज ओवर नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन सर नेक्स्ट yes sir my next talk is on human and snake and human interaction can you hear sir yeah yeah, yeah. please yes yes i have selected this uh, subject why because i believe that if we educate people by snake bite awareness program so bite incidents can be reduced promptly next sir mark see this is my hospital at dharampur sir my record from 1993 to 23 uh, november 2020 total number of snake bite patients are 16615 total number of non venomous snake bite patient are 9861 total number of venomous snake bite patient are 6754 total number of cobra bite patient are 504 total number of common crate bite are 751 total number of russell viper patient as 4070 total number of soskel viper patient are 1401 total number of bamboo pit viper 26 one is a uh, some uh, controversial but uh, i put in the r viper is one total number of sender collar is one total number of death 129 next you can see on graphically see death i i will comment something total number what 29 death but more than 50% death are uh, a patient just come enter in the step of hospital and died snake bite this all we know so i will not take time this also belief in faith faith healing in our area is very dangerous but today i proudly say that nowadays most of the snake bite patient victims are directly coming to hospital is a non venomous snakes found in our area common wine common wolf common sand soa cat snake and this rat snake and so on venomous snake usually these are common indian cobra common crate russell viper bamboo pit viper and soskel viper how we manage patient when uh, any victim came to us just we show in our uh, file that you identify snake in file otherwise many times the patient relative brought photographs in mobile or many times they brought dead snake so we can identify snake according to that we can start treatment 
this uh, one photograph is over here that uh, arrow is shown this is a rescue in in my town and uh, while something mistake he done and for 27 second by time was occur see main important this is occurrence of in this incident if we know the occurrence of incidents then we can definitely prevent uh, bite incidents Mo, uh, this is the cobra cobra bite incidents nearby house or house in house for its prey also in farm bite time early morning evening and at least number in day time bite most common on the extremities in house while doing routine work see in our area then um, people when start to um, make a food then they have to fire so most of the time these firing woods are uh, kept at the site by the home here one the most of the cereals in our area people keeping in a such a container and they uh, when they uh, start removing they made a ho hole and from that hole the uh, cereals can be removed the cobra enter inside and take rest then uh, when next day uh, if they take again the cereals then bite incidents occur this all the photographs i am trying to show you that bite incidents occur most of the time at this time see this uh, one child uh, bitten by cobra and she came to me at the last grasp of respiration now uh, this arrow shows that uh, cobra was there at the, she was playing there and bite incidents occur and she brought to me at the last grass and i visited her home and uh, advised people of the surrounding that how to uh, how to be prevented from bite incidents see this uh, this uh, old lady had cobra bite then this is i am showing you that is a uh, handmade uh, stone grinder in our area and cobra was hidden under side when she uh, walk to go inside a house and bite incidents occur now the common kites incident scenario is the most common incident in house while sleeping on ground and monsoon season time is 11 pm to 4 am bite area around the neck ear lobule nose etc that shown in the mark that uh, at the nose snake hide under the bed of human for warmth this is our precious child 7 year olds uh, la, uh, two years been passed she brought us to the at the last uh, moment referred from the other hospital in a very serious condition with very uh, many complications many complication like aspirated pneumonia septicemia uh and while treatment she developed a stressed gi bleeding and uh, bp suddenly we lost then ultimately she came out and we are happy that after 29 we can send home with a very happy uh, smiling this is russell viper incidents most commonly while working in farm most incidents is during evening and at early night while walking on road nowadays people coming of the victims of the russell viper as the main incidence is walking on road at the uh, night time most uh, common site is extremities most common uh, monsoon season and post monsoon season here you can see the uh, she is working in farm in post monsoon season and incidence can occur this also the one i am trying to see you the that man is picking the drumstick and he is seeing it a drumstick only and not looking to the ground and one patient came with the, me with the same incident that he had uh, gone for the picking of the drumstick and he become a victim of russell viper all are working in the farm and can become a victim of the snake bite this is the one patient had uh, from the other district had severe complication you can see in photograph and he undergone the 11 times hemodialysis and finally he recover and go home this is a saw scale viper incidents while working in farm during day time common bites at the extremities incidents occur round the year see this photograph this boy is uh, doing something uh, and not seeing it at the ground level and incidents may occur these child are playing nearby the house and 
incidence may occur this is so scale wiper you can see bleeding uh, from tongue any bleeding from the ear and uh, large amount of bleeding from the uh, that uh, another person and i have to give 30 wires to control bleeding and finally he saved bamboo pit wiper incidence is while working in farm during day time common bite side extremities and monsoon and post monsoon season this child came to me 4 years back with a severe bleeding and bleeding was not stopped even the bed of the child was also studded with the blood and finally i have to give uh, 30 vials of asv and finally uh, uh, her mother is uh, uh, smiling to see her child see the how the how we are suffering the traveling uh, problem in our area the victim is brought in the such a way to the hospital not directly hospital they have to brought somewhere they can get vehicle and then they can come to hospital so while coming to the hospital most of the death can occur i am running uh, this uh, snake bite awareness program in many colleges community uh, places schools and like this so my aim is to reduce the incidence of bite so uh, this is very important i think so thank you very much research center uh, uh, one thing is more near time we are start uh, going to start snake bite research center at dharampur the aim is vinam collection center and that uh, and after collecting that center we will supply vinam to the anti vinam producer companies okay, okay sir Uh, you are finished. I assume. Yes, I finished, sir. Yes, there are a few questions. Uh, by the way, I would like to congratulate you on this very action-packed presentation with so many cases and all that. Uh, I think a lot of uh, people in the audience have uh, appreciated you, uh, including uh, Professor David Warrell, who has uh, made a special mention about this presentation, and he says that he would be very uh, happy to visit your hospital also. and uh, he has you know really acknowledged uh, your uh, years of dedication uh, towards the treatment of uh, snake bite in your area i i i'd like to you know pick up a couple of questions for you uh, from the chat box i'm not very really sure most of uh, the comments are uh, laudatory uh, in nature uh, congratulating you for this very fascinating presentation i'm not very really sure whether there are any specific questions but uh, On, on behalf of the organizers, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, Dr. Patel. Thank you, sir. No question. Can we go to next presentation? Yeah. Next presentation is. Can we go to next presentation? Next presentation is a brief history of Russell Swiper. Bite in Bangladesh and its role in snake bite environment. The police, which head Department of Tropical Medicine and Public Health, University of Germany. Welcome, sir, for this uh, conference, snake bite conference. Can you go ahead, Ulrich? Can you hear us? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to stop on my screen. Yeah, you can share your screen. Okay. You can share your screen. Sir, sir please. You can go, go ahead, sharing screen. Hello. <laughs> Okay. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this excellent meeting and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, as usual, um, it's not just me; we are actually a much larger group. Your audio isn't clear. 
your audio is not clear is it better like this uh what you could do is you could pause the video you could take yourself off video that will probably make it clearer okay that's fine can i try now sir video possible go ahead rudri ah um, is the audio is it better now uh it's it's not uh, the audio isn't clear something to do with your mic is it uh, is it better now it's slightly better should we try like this or on like wrong uh okay i think what we'll do is we'll move on to the next speaker when you can you get it sorted out in the time only i'll try perhaps i can i can try by a now, by a phone now it's better now it's better okay well in that case then um i'll try um can you see the screen at least yeah of course we do we, we see the screen um so um we're actually a much larger team especially first and foremost here at the venom research center at Chittagong Medical College in Chattogram, Bangladesh. And then together with a large list of uh, excellent collaborators, uh, including from faraway places, um, which we have listed here. These are the um, institutions and collaborators uh, most um, closely related to the present presentation here. In the previous talk and in several talks before, we have heard about Russell Swiper, and we all think we know Russell Swiper, but there are, as we have seen, many more things to be discovered. One thing that uh, has long been known is that Russell Swipers have a kind of patchy distribution, um, and that is actually also true for the areas that we tend to think are more or less solidly or completely inhabited by that species. So even within areas where we say, okay, Russell's viper is present, we may find them in certain areas, but not in others. And um, there are not always uh, very obvious um, ecological reasons um, behind this. So this deserves uh, more analysis. One question that has intrigued us for a long time is the question whether Russell's viper in Venoming actually occurs in Bangladesh. And um, certainly from um, the cases in the catchment area of Chittagong Medical College uh, over the past decades, there has been no indication that uh, Southeastern Bangladesh um, has any Russell's Viper envenoming cases. Um, so we uh, dug in the old literature and um, one thing I came across is a very old uh, book of a compilation actually of very short anecdotal snake bite case histories. Um, some of them are not useful at all, but some with um, sufficient clinical detail and uh, especially locality details to say that at least in the 1920s, Russell's viper inventing did occur in certain parts of Bangladesh because the clinical symptoms described and uh, also the, the name of the snake uh, people refer to, but uh, mostly the clinical syndrome, if enough detail was given, indicated that uh, this by all likelihood should have been cases of Russell's viper envenoming. Um, then where did these cases in the 1920s happen? And we found if we located them uh, to present day Bangladesh map, um, we had them in the very, Northwest and uh, in the extreme east and uh, sorry, west, the southwest of the country. Districts like Satkira, Kulna, uh, Jashor, Dinajpur, and so on. Um, but since then, uh, we have not heard of a single proven case of Russell's viper envenoming. 
So we looked out for them. And uh, sure enough, in uh, the, uh, 2013, the first proven case came in into a Rush Study Medical College Hospital. And we, went the, we, we then went out to uh, look for the uh, specimens, the snakes that had caused the bite. And in the first cases, we had to go forensic. We had to uh, excavate, uh, exhume basically the um, snake responsible for the bite. And here's our colleague, Dr. Rasad from Russia in the College Hospital holding the plastic bag. You can imagine quite a spectacle for the villagers to um, observe um, physicians from the medical college coming and doing that. Um, but it served us to get the evidence that actually this was definitely Russell's viper. And um, this series continued then, um, mostly at Russian Medical College Hospital. Now, this is the first specimen, um, the first live snake from that area that we got our hands on, that we uh, managed to extract the venom for further analysis. And uh, this is a map of um, about 20 cases of Russell's viper and venom being um, coming into Russia Medical College Hospital, all from those um, surrounding Western districts of Bangladesh, here marked in red. Um, just to briefly uh, give you an impression of the first 20 proven cases, specimen proven cases with snake at hand, or at least the clearly identifiable uh, photograph in some cases. Um, 19 of these were admitted to Russia Medical College, one to Patwarkali District Hospital, which is in uh, southern Bangladesh. And uh, as we've heard, most um, happened uh, during work in paddy fields, but interestingly, some were also caused um, while fishing, especially with Russell's vipers who had apparently been swimming in the water and uh, were entangled in fishing nets. Almost all of the patients first went to a traditional healer, unfortunately, with the usual procedures applied. And this has resulted in a, a significant delay between the time of bite and finally hospital admission. So the earliest one came at roughly two hours, um, the latest after 22 hours, and on average, about nine hours after the bite. And uh, that has led to a full-blown um, picture of uh, Russell's viper and venom syndrome in um, all but one who was not envenomed. Um, and it's especially noteworthy here that uh, half of the patients uh, presented already with um, indications of acute kidney injury. Um, in addition to every one of them uh, having uh, bleeding and non-clotting blood. Um, the one case from Southern Bangladesh was um, particular in that it also had uh, Neurotoxic uh, symptoms and signs of envenoming, uh, having uh, bilateral ptosis, ophthalmophilia, and that one, uh, that person also had a capillary leakage syndrome. Um, certainly, neurotoxicity was not seen in those patients in uh, Russia. The treatment of those patients um, included, in addition to um, um, ancillary treatment, uh, management of acute kidney injury, and, and also surgical intervention, treatment with Indian potable and antivenom. Um, the minimum doses applied was 100 milliliters and the maximum 500 milliliters, which is uh, 50 vials. And um, despite the, the treatment uh, that they received, 12 of the 20 patients died and several more of them um, um, recovered partially with um, severe disability also. So this um, alarmingly poor outcome of those patients um, also motivated us to um, establish the Venom Research Center in Chittagong Medical College with the goal of uh, producing the locally existing snake venoms needed to, more, to make more um, regionally appropriate and more effective antivenoms. Um, by 2018, as you can see here, the center established in 2017 was already um, prepared to host the high level visitors. And it has by now grown to a um, professional facility um, that has 10 different species of uh, venomous snake from Bangladesh, including five different species of krite and at the moment, 168 um, live snakes in the 
uh, colony for in production. Um, now this has allowed us to um, produce uh, the necessary venom for uh, deeper analyses, which uh, collaborators have conducted here. Um, this pie chart, just to remind you um, of the talk um, delivered by Juan Calvete, who has spoken about this uh, study already. And uh, I just want to highlight a few additional aspects uh, from that publication. And that is again, the um, antivenomics analysis, which involved four different antivenoms and demonstrated that uh, the tested antivenoms could bind only very low quantities of Russell's viper venom from Bangladesh. And that the lethal activity to mice of that venom, although it may be um, caused by different venom components uh, than in human uh, by victims, it was not neutralized by the Indian antivenom. So we have a problem here. And um, the tested antivenoms could only bind low percentages of the major identified relevant important toxins in Brussels viper venom from Bangladesh. And if we translate this to um, the number of vials um, needed um, to neutralize a certain amount of either a toxin group or um, whole venom, that tells us that uh, we need a large number of uh, vials of these polyvalent antivenoms to bind, uh, bind at least, uh, and we're talking about in vitro binding, not even neutralization in vivo, um, the venom of um, these snakes from Bangladesh. So in conclusion, um, we um, have already heard from Juan Calvete that these antivenoms are made using southern Russell's viper venoms only, and many of the toxins of Russell's viper from um, Bangladesh are not only very poorly recognized by these antivenoms. And uh, this is a big problem. And then the late arrival of the patients to hospital care is also another uh, big problem because we've seen in, in Myanmar the experience is um, Russell's viper patients uh, should arrive at, uh, should get antivenom therapy within one or two hours after the bite to prevent um, acute kidney injury in that setting with that species of Russell's viper. So something similar might be the case here. By now, um, we have received and collected Russell's vipers from basically across Bangladesh. Um, the triangles here showing um, spec live specimens um, in uh, Venom Research Center. And uh, this tells us that presumably the species is really widely spread in Bangladesh and it had been um, either overlooked previously, um, maybe due to the fact that many snake bite patients still um, do not uh, reach allopathic medical care, but go to local, treat, uh, local healers, um, or um, perhaps even uh, recent shifts in the abundance and distribution of these snakes. Um, now, recently, um, we even uh, came across this um, interesting thing here. If you're walking along the beach of the Bay of Bengal in Chittagong district, certainly the last thing you expect to find um, in the mud right next to the seawater is a Russell's viper. One would expect there might be a sea snake uh, washed ashore. Um, but sure enough, uh, Russell's viper um, surfaced there in, in August of this year. And uh, it might have been a snake um, washed ashore from a nearby island or from the opposite coast even um, from southern Bangladesh or maybe washed down a river from higher up in the Chittagong Hill tracks. Um, this is certainly something we uh, are investigating um, further and uh, it's uh, quite worrying to have Russell's vipers basically at our doorsteps. Um, well within the catchment area of Chittagong Medical College Hospital. Um, and uh, despite the fact that um, none of the snake bite cases admitted there since Professor M.A. Fies and his team started to systematically study snake bites uh, in that hospital in the early 1990s, um, was attributable to Russell's viper, uh, either by uh, envenoming syndrome or by the snake broad. 
uh, or by immunoassay. Um, so a very interesting um, development possibly. Um, surely enough, um, land use has changed in the region, the climate has changed in the region, and uh, we should not uh, assume that uh, distribution and abundance of important venomous snakes would remain static in the face of such dramatic changes. So there's uh, a lot more work to do and interesting things to discover here. So our next steps are to conduct a comprehensive genomics and antivenomics and genetic analysis of Russell's vipers in Bangladesh with a very high geographic resolution. Um, we still need to um, expand our sampling there um, to uncover also the differences in venom composition activities and antivenom reactivity between uh, males and females, between juveniles and adults, um, and individuals, importantly, not only um, across the geographic uh, distribution range. Um, at the same time, we aim to produce large quantities of Russell's viper venom from Bangladesh uh, to be included in the production of an improved antivenom because um, Russell's viper uh, venom from Bangladesh and from the Northeast of its uh, distribution is clearly missing in the current uh, antivenoms as we have seen. Uh, we also intend to stock large quantities of the existing antivenoms in high risk endemic areas and uh, to promote antivenom therapy at the primary healthcare level because the time factor is so critical in preventing acute kidney injury in Russell's viper in venom. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention. I hope the audio was not too terrible. Yeah, Dr. Ulrich, there was minimal uh, audio quality issues, but I think uh, it managed it. Uh, but the quality of the work you have done and your presentation was uh, truly impressive. Uh, I'll just share some questions. Uh, give us a minute. Yeah, there is, there is a question from uh, Dr. David Barrel. Um, Ulrich, fascinating detective work. Any suggestion? of the pituitary adrenal insufficiency reported from India, including adjacent West Bengal. This might contribute to the high case fatality. So the question is about any suggestion or suspicion of uh, pituitary adrenal um, insufficiency. Yeah. I, I, try, I try to, to read it, I could not hear you properly. Uh, Dr. David Wardle had a question regarding Russell's viper in Bangladesh, were there any reports suggestive of pituitary adrenal insufficiency, hypopituitarism, which has been reported from India now as also from West Bengal? Did you get that? Yes, I could. Uh, I'm hearing now. Um, but we have no information on that so far. Um, it's definitely something that, uh, that should have been checked, um, but um, among those 20 cases, we have not, we have not seen this. Um, but um, as you mentioned that by now, we are counting um, more than 60. So in analyzing the larger series, uh, we will definitely pay a close look to that. Uh, there's a, another question from Saganand Rao from India. What is the percentage of nephrotoxicity with Russell's viper in Bangladesh? What percentage of people actually go on to develop nephrotoxicity? Those uh, 20 cases, you see one was non envenomed and uh, among the other 19, there were 10 patients already presented on admission with acute kidney injury. And then, in addition, um, there were others who had um, dark brown, like urine, um, indicative of uh, myoglobinuria um, and or elevated CK values. Um, so that uh, would, um, in, in the short run, also lead to additional problems with the kidneys. So it's, it's quite, uh, it is ordinary among the population of the patients in Russia in medical college to. Um, to have uh, acute kidney injury after Russell's viper. Ulrich, uh, 
audio isn't clear if there's any question you could re you could re reply to that on the chat box okay did you so you could just respond to the questions on the chat box wonderful work ulrich god bless you and keep the good work going thank you so we will move on to the penultimate so we move on to the penultimate talk of this conference the speaker is dr shyamal kundu he is the head of the department of medicine in bankura medical college he sees a lot of patients of snake bite especially post rainy season and uh, i i request dr shyamal to go ahead with his presentation am i audible yeah you are okay uh i am very much pleased to be here in the august assembly uh i especially thank to dr menon for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity i also thank the organizers uh uh i have been given the uh, topic of uh, snake bite the bengal story well uh, west bengal is a state of uh, can i go to, can i get the first slide first slide yes the west bengal is a, a state of geographical diversity with its uh, northern hilly state uh, stay areas and forests in the south himalayan region in the south region the south region southeast region there is coastal areas and sundarban forest in the middle part there is a plain land by the two sides of the uh, river ganges and also we have the southwest part which is a rare dry laterite plateau land with lot of forests so uh, within this geographical variability they are uh, stay snakes of west bengal grows so uh, in the uh, northern areas particularly in the sub himalayan uh, for terrain forest we get mostly the uh, cobras particularly nayanaya and uh, mm, the nay uh, kelty uh, is very is very rare in this part and uh, king cobras are reported over here and also some uh, rathos viper and crates are there in the uh, middle part there is equal distribution of crates cobras and rathos viper in the southern uh, southeast uh, uh, region we have mostly the <clears throat> crates and uh, cobras and uh, also the uh, russell's viper in the south west region we have uh, mostly the vipers uh, but uh, vipers means uh, the tall scaled viper in west bengal and others are common crate the cobras are uh, not very common and out of that only the uh, this uh, snakes uh, the nanaza uh, kevtia is uh, mostly seen we have few reported cases of uh, naya naya in the uh, areas of uh, uh, other, the adjacent areas of uh, other districts so in uh, uh, i uh, what i want to uh, please the uh, previous slide please previous slide please so uh, so this variability cannot be accommodated in a single frame as a common picture of a snake bite in west bengal uh, we have mm, different different uh, uh, peaks here the, the presentations but the epidemiological picture is almost same i am working in a uh, in the southeast region as a chodi medicine uh in the uh, medical in the medical college which uh, serves around say, 2500 square kilometer and is uh, covering three districts which is a uh, which is a, a huge number of patients is to come so due to the time constraint i could not arrange uh, all data from different parts so i am giving you today uh, the data from our medical college which will give you a uh, uh, almost half of the picture of west bengal because the maximum snake bite also occurs in that part of the uh, uh in, in this part of the country uh, you see the uh, very the people mostly are 
working if the male and female both people are working uh, in the fields and uh, in, the, in the forest. So there are a lot of snake bites. Next slide, please. So I have collected the data of this year, uh, starting from January to October. And here in our medical college, all total 850 patients were admitted. There are 619 male and 231 female. You see the uh, females uh, are mostly uh, got the snake bites in the household area. And here the common crate is quite common than common And uh, males uh, are often affected in the uh, working field. Russell's viper bite is common in male. However, in the home uh, uh, premises, they get uh, bites by common crates. Next one, please. So you see the uh, month-wise uh, admission rate. And uh, uh, it has a peak. The red one is the male and the uh, uh, green one is the female. It, it has a peak in uh, July, August. But he, uh, usually in the other, uh, and again on one peak in the September. So in, uh, usually in the previous years, we have the major peak in the uh, July, August, and uh, uh, by September. For the peak. So in this time, we have the lockdown period between the April, May, and June, and human mobility progressively normalizes from uh, uh, July to August and, and September. That's why we had a second peak in the September. Next one. So this is the month-wise distribution. Uh, we have the maximum uh, case admission in the month of July, and uh, sorry, in the month of September, uh, July, and then the September. So we have two peaks this time, this year. Next one. So we have uh, out of uh, total 850 cases, 638 was detected to be in benumbed cases. And of them, the 362 cases were more toxic by it. Sorry. We've lost your audio, Dr. Shaman. Uh, we will uh, wait for a uh, couple of minutes. So we are trying to reach Dr. Shaman. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Am I yeah, audible you, now? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Please. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm very sorry because of this problem. So, uh, this uh, all those patients we used the national STG for treating those patients. We had total out of 850 patients uh, in in venomed cases was 638. And the dry bite was detected to be 212. Neurotoxic bite was 236. Neurotoxic bites were detected either by uh, uh, envenomous features of envenomation. And uh, also, we did uh, uh, the neostigmine challenge test to all the neurotoxic bites, and thereby we divided it to be a crate bite or a cobra bite. Hemotoxic bite was 362. Next slide, please. 
in the uh, uh, in spatial query when during the admission we try to find out how many patients have uh, received the fast aid and out of uh, all patients 168 patients and 20 percent of the patients uh, they followed the right in the right way and uh, uh, 24 percent of the patients followed the uh, right to some extent Many of them did not follow that the patient should not walk. Patients, they, they, they use the two and tourniquets and, and so on. No first aid was uh, seen in 56% of the cases. Mostly they are very local patients. And we found that 10.82% patients uh, went to faith healer fast. And after that, wasting a lot of time, came to our hospital in a very late stage. And, uh, uh, but this, uh, comparing to the previous years, the uh, number of these uh, faith healer practice is progressively coming down. This time it is almost 10 to 10.82%. The average uh, uh, bite to a first dose of ASP time was calculated to be 3.6 hours, uh, ranging from 1.2 hours to even 12.6 hours. Next, please. So we, we had the respirate, uh, support uh, CCU care in the hospital, and we found that 161 patients uh, required hemodialysis. Respiratory support was needed for 64% of the cases, 64 cases, and COVID care was uh, required for six patients. We uh, actually, those patients were admitted with snake bite. We first, for the first case, we had a patient who ultimately was treated in the CCU. For We could not uh, um, uh, wean the patient from the ventilator. Then we trust, suspected and then we uh, found that this is COVID at the PCR positive. And after that, we made mandatory for all patients with a snake bite and seriousness uh, to be tested for COVID. And we got all six cases up till now. And there was no new requirement of surgical intervention this year. Next. You see, the uh, anti snake venom use and the uh, deaths in patients total AVS used was uh, 6,114. This, we don't use any fraction of um, uh, 10. We, our protocol is to use 10 vials for each of the patients. We go for 20 vials maximum for the neurotoxic bites and uh, 30 vials maximum for the hemotoxic bites. For some special cases, when we feel that the patient is not at all responding, then we go up to 40 uh, vials. So not more than that. But here, uh, this uh, odd number, this numbers are not uh, multiplied by 10. That means that these numbers, we, for the first time when patient comes, sometimes we are referred from the peripheral hospital, they give five, seven, six sometimes. So we calculate the, 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 we give the first dose as the rest of the 10 plus the 10 vials. So some patients at the first time get 14 vials or sometimes 13 vials, there's like that. And after that, the next, in our hospital, we use always 10 vials for any session of uh, ASB use. Average ASB per patient calculated is seven. Average ASB for saved patient is calculated to be 10. And here you see that the uh, snake, but the death and the AVS use is proportional and there is no difference. So uh, it, it, it means that the most uh, predictive factor of snake bite death is the is not the anti-snake venom uh, use, rather than it is the time window between the bite and the uh, fast dose of ASB. That we appreciated in uh, our uh, hospital experiences. Next. So it is the month-wise distribution of ASB use and death. You see, it is correlated with the uh, number of patients admitted in the hospital in uh, each month. Next. Next one, please. So see in uh, deaths in snake and venomation, total 34 deaths were recorded. Uh, males were 21 and uh, female were uh, 13. Next. Next. So if you look at the month-wise distrib distribution of deaths, this also follows the number of admission. So it is maximum in September and uh, October. And, uh, this is male and female patients. So uh, 
it, 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 the, the dates are not very much disproportionate in each of the months. Next. So this is the month-wise distribution of uh, dates. You see in the uh, August and September, the dates were maximum. May, in the uh, in May, uh, the may, maximum date was recorded in uh, September. And also in female, the maximum date was recorded in uh, September. Next. So we have uh, faced many complications. Uh, if you look at the complications for, uh, in general, we had sepsis in 57% uh, of the patients. We have respiratory failure about 1.1%, uh, uh, unexplained deaths in 0.5%. The complications of hemotoxic snake bite was maximum. In AKI, we found uh, in 33%, 33.14% 33 of the patients. ARDS, we got in 14% of the patients. Uh, Maha we got in 3.3% of the cases and capillary leak of 2.2% of the cases and myocarditis and sudden death was uh, noted in 2.48% of the patients. Next one. In, the, in our hemodialysis unit, we uh, in uh, this year, total uh, 362 uh, out of this total 362 hemotoxic snake bites. We had dialysis was given in 161 patients, and, uh, and the 201 patient did not require uh, hemodialysis. So 40 45 percent of the patient of a patient uh, received hemodialysis. Next one. You see the month-wise distribution of hemodialysis requirement. And that is again uh, uh, is uh, corroborated with the uh, number of uh, admi patient admission, and it is maximum in the September. And uh, in between the July to September, there were uh, more number of hemodialysis patients. Next. So we uh, uh, we uh, undertook a project of uh, efficacy of forced alkaline diuresis. Uh, in patients with uh, hemotoxic snake bite, and we need it as per the standard protocol, and also it is recommended in our national STG. So we had total 171 patients, and 86% uh, patients were responsive. 14% patients we did not find found any uh, response that they, they went into uh, acute kidney injury. Some of them received hemodialysis. So we feel it to be very much effective in uh, 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 hemotoxic snake bite, particularly the Russell's viper bite, which is the only viper in, uh, available in our can, uh, part of the uh, country. Next one. So we, in our CCU, we have the uh, CCU care, the total almost, uh, total almost uh, 19 patient, hemotoxic patients were treated in the CCU. 2.97% out of total uh, patients, and 13% uh, patients received uh, uh, from the neurotoxic uh, 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 group received respiratory care. Vasopressor was needed for 0.4%. Uh, vasopressor, uh, usually we, we use vasopressor in our uh, general, general ward, and we have a special uh, room for snake bite management and we mm, uh, appoint our uh, SRs and the uh, housemans to keep very close watch on them so that most of the vasopressors are uh, being used in the general ward and they do not come to the CCU care. And we found that the in, in Russell's Viper bite, maximum patient develop hypotension within three days and the good fluid management is uh, okay for them. Some of them require vasopressors. Positive pressure artificial ventilation was required for 64 patients, that is 10 for 10 percent patients, and uh, as, uh, and the and, and the uh, CCO data is again is well corroborated is not well corroborated with the uh, with the, uh, uh, the is in, uh, admission data. So you we got maximum CCO patient in the May and June, and uh, in the, the August September. We have a lesser number of patients uh, requiring post-repressor artificial ventilation. In the July, however, 
the maximum patient is a neurotoxic by in uh, uh, otherwise uh, in and uh, in uh, other than the april may june the uh, ccu care is almost uh, equ uh, equivalent to the uh, number of patients admitted next one so this is the concluding side you can see the uh, this is the image of uh, goddess durga the idol of our west bengal cul culture and you mm -hmm. see here the uh, goddess is fighting with uh, evil force mahishasura and she has used a snake as a weapon and you see that the uh, the uh, the demon king is not very much attentive to the snake because perhaps he also knows that the snake bite is manageable so the message is that we have to still confidence that much confidence to the common people by improving our armamentum and the clinical care so that the everybody can be very much confident we need not uh, unheal it snake species from the world we have to uh, we have to live with the snakes but we have to provide confidence by improving our clinical care thank you thank you for patience hearing thank you dr shyamal you see an incredible number of cases every year phenomenal numbers these and uh, overall the mortality figures are also reasonable uh, a couple of questions a lot of people have uh, have a congratulatory method uh, messages primarily because of the number of cases that you see and the way that you present it uh, vishal santra has a question he asks us to if the number of deaths are more in august and september whether it could be related to crate bite and whether there's been any fall off in this way well in august and september obviously uh, we found that the in august and september uh the uh, respiratory care required is less so probably in the august and september the maximum deaths were due to russell's viper bite russell's and in uh, what would what is your take are the number of snake bites more this year post covid or is it the usual number as seen last year and the year before last no sir uh, uh, we uh, the last year at the uh, uh, in 2018 we had a total number of cases in around uh, 1000 to 1200 so this year it is uh, 200 less uh, or 2 to 300 less this is perhaps the peak season is a uh, june july may june july that in our uh, state the, there was lockdown from uh, april may june so from the june onwards there was move, uh, human movement, so snake bite increased in that. Part. However, uh, if you uh, go through the total number, the two to three hundred total case has been obviously reduced in this year. And Dr. Shyamal, on, on what basis do you decide whether to give post alkaline diuresis or do you give it in most cases? Well, we, uh, we follow the KDGO criteria, the usual criteria which we, our uh, uh, attorneys, houseman, and the PGTs follow is that we can we measure the urine output. If the urine out for every six hours, we measure the urine output. If the urine output decrement of urine output uh, uh, by more than 0.3 ml per kg per hour, then we take it as a early sign of uh, a kidney injury. And we don't have any uh, point of care uh, um, uh, assessment of creatinine. Uh, previously, nowadays we have a uh, new installed dry chemistry machine. So from, so from last month we are getting uh, creatinine also. So beforehand we used only the urine output, and now we are using the creatinine level also. So in the uh, increment of 0.5 milligram per uh, per uh, day uh, in a, per six hours is uh, uh, taken to be the earliest indication of starting fad. Wonderful work, Dr. Shyaman. Keep up the good work. And we move on to the last session. Uh, like on the first day, I had the privilege of uh, introducing to the audience Professor David Worrell. Uh, I today have the privilege of introducing uh, the second famous David of uh, the field of uh, snake bite management, Dr. David Williams. 
uh, who actually, just like Professor David Worley, needs really no introduction. Uh, because if anybody has been doing anything in the field of snake bite management, they should have heard of him, just like, uh, you know, in the case of Professor David Worley. But uh, for the sake of uh, completion, I will uh, run through his uh, very extensive kind of credentials. Dr. David Williams has been immediate past head of Australian Venom Research Unit, Department of Pharmacology, University of Melbourne. And uh, he's also been associated with the University of Papua New Guinea. He's done a lot of work, in fact, in uh, Papua New Guinea. Everybody knows about that. Uh, uh, Dr. David Williams is also consultant to the Department for the Control of Neglect and Tropical Diseases in the Department of uh, Regulation and pre and World Health Organization, very closely associated with the WHO, and has done a lot of work in the field of uh, anti venom, especially in making it better and better uh, with uh, you know, his association with the WHO. He has international experience spanning 25 years, you know, covering a, a number of geographic uh, regions in Papua New Guinea, Southeast Asia, India, and East Africa. And I may mention that I've had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Dr. David Williams in person in uh, one of the conferences, most memorably the one in Melbourne, Australia, uh, where I had a wonderful you know, kind of interaction and was greatly impressed with him and his work. So I now invite Dr. David Williams to the online stage. Sir, the stage is all yours. Okay, can you hear me, everybody? Yes, we do. Great, thank you very much. I'll just um, get you to move to the next slide. It's easier if we just use your system to bring it forwards. Um, thanks for that really kind introduction. I wanted to talk today about WHO's strategy for the prevention and control of snake bite envenoming. And we'll flip over to another slide and just talk briefly about what we know about the problem. And as you have all heard today uh, and over the last few days in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, in South and Southeast Asia and Latin America, snake bite literally does destroy millions of lives every year. So we'll go next. And you all know the statistics. Um, WHO at the moment is using these figures between 4.5 and 5.4 million snake bites, of which up to 2.7 million are envenomed and somewhere between 81,000 and 138,000 deaths and 400,000 disabilities. We know that South Asia in particular is responsible for a huge part of that burden and I think for that reason alone, this is a very timely meeting. And I think keeping the impetus moving in India and in neighboring countries around this issue, particularly trying to bring in political support um, to move policy is a really crucial thing. So I'll just go to the next slide. And I just wanted to give just a couple of examples of the fact that even though we talk about those typical things of incidence, mortality and disability, there are lots of other problems. And if we look at some of the parts of the world, um, of course, in India, there's a, a very good study by Dr. Vyapuri's team um, that showed that 64.5% were paying more than two weeks wages for snake bite treatment and over 50% were having to sell property, land, motor vehicles or take their kids out of school. Similarly, in Bangladesh, a study there found 61.4% had to take out loans to pay for snake bite treatment, and 4% were mortgaging their homes and businesses. So this is a real hidden impact. And if you look at countries like Myanmar, where 50% of patients require renal dialysis, and in the talk that we just heard, the burden of renal dialysis in Bengal is huge. Um, these are things that don't normally get looked at by policy makers when they're thinking about snake bite as a problem. And it's very important that we make sure that some of these sorts of problems are, are well and truly seen. In Sri Lanka, there's been the study that showed that uh, more than 50% of people suffered from um, post envenoming diagnoses of depression and that 21% of those were, were diagnosed as PTSD. Um, Anti-venom is the other problem that we have, and there's a, a lot that's going to be done about anti-venoms from various areas. 
but I think even today it's important to recognise that in places where I work, like Papua New Guinea, less than 20% of the anti-venom needed was actually available because of cost and inadequate procurement. Now, similarly in West Africa, there was a situation where only 2.5% of the people who needed anti-venom were able to have access to it. And when it was available, the cost of treatment was greater than one month's wages. So wherever we go, there are problems um, that go beyond just incidence, mortality and, and disability per se. So let's slip to the next slide. And realistically, I'll just summarise very quickly what's happened over the last five years. So in 2015, you all heard about the fact that Sanofi Pasteur were pulling out of the African anti-venom market and it caused a lot of angst and concern. It attracted a lot of media attention and organisations like the Global Snake Bite Initiative, Health Action International, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier in particular, um, really started to make noise about this. So that led to a meeting that was held in uh, Cambridge that was organised by the team from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And as a result of that, it really sort of pushed this whole area to the forefront. Um, after that meeting, Tim Reid and myself and my colleague Diana Barr, um, we went to Geneva and we sat down with WHO and said, look, you know, how do we approach getting more attention to this? And they explained quite rightly that WHO doesn't just have the ability to pick up an issue and run with it. WHO is the secretariat for the member states, the 199, I think, countries around the world um, that are members of the WHO. And just like any organisation, they have to follow the mandate that's given to them by country. So it was impressed upon us that there was a need to get country support and get the countries themselves to ask WHO to do something. And that's essentially what we did. Um, Health Action International, the Global Snake Bite Initiative, with help from Medicine Sans Frontières, um, the African Society of Venomology, and lots of toxinology people, lots of snake bite doctors, lots of research scientists around the world. We pestered enough of our governments to get, I think, around about 28 of them to apply to have a meeting at the WHO in 2016 during the World Health Assembly. And from that meeting, we got agreement that there should be a reapplication for listing as a neglected tropical disease. So again, those countries led the process um, with support from GSI and HAI. We put together a dossier that they submitted to WHO and that resulted in Margaret Chan um, agreeing to add snake bite to the list of neglected tropical diseases in June 2017. But it didn't stop there because a, a listing of a disease is, is one part of the puzzle, but you have to have a mandate from the countries that has a lot more depth and breadth to it. So again, working with countries and in particular with the leadership of Costa Rica, um, we were able to draft a resolution that was presented to the 2018 World Health Assembly. And that resolution finally gave WHO a very specific but broad mandate to address um, snake bite around the world. It also called upon the member states themselves. And this is really important because WHO doesn't have a vault full of money. I've gone looking for it and I can't find it. Um, they rely on member state contributions to fund their programs and they rely more and more, and particularly in the 2030 work plan for NTDs, they rely more and more upon countries to support the implementation process. So it's really important that that resolution called not just on WHO to do certain things, but it also called upon the countries themselves and it was unanimously passed. And if we can move to the next slide, that then brings us to the point in 2019, where as the result of the work of a, a working group of people from around the world, um, a snake bite in venoming strategy for prevention and control 
was developed and produced by WHO and launched at the World Health Assembly last year. And it's a four-pronged strategy, and I want to sort of go through that. So we'll we'll move through it fairly quickly so that there's some time for questions. Um, I hope you can read the information on the slides, but I know that these will be available later. So if I don't touch on every point, don't worry about it. The information is there for you to go through. And as we move to the next slide, um, certainly if you have questions, post them so that we can answer them at the end. Um, it's a phased approach. There are three phases, a pilot phase that we're in at the moment, where we're looking to test certain interventions in a relatively small number of countries with the original aim that by 2021, we'd be starting to scale up. But of course, COVID then stepped in. And it may well be that we're running a year behind schedule because of that. Although in many respects, our work plan at WHO this year has continued relatively uninterrupted. Um, the, the biggest delay that we have is in getting the financial support that's necessary to roll out activities. But in terms of planning for them strategically, um, getting the, the other parts of the resource packages in place and being in a position where we can start to roll things out, we have actually been making um, good progress. And of course, from 2025, we hope that we will roll out a whole package of interventions for any country who wants them with the ultimate aim of reducing mortality and disability by 50% within the next 10 years. So as we go to the next slide, um, there are four areas that we're covering. And I think it's really important that this starts at the grassroots. So in the WHO strategy, we have prioritised educating and engaging with communities to prevent snake bite uh, and to improve risk avoidance and a few other things as being really crucial. So if we go to the next slide. This part of the, the, the program is likely to cost somewhere around uh, $26.2 million to implement over the period of time. It is a strategy that recognises the fact that most of the victims of snake fight are young, productive people. They've been able to earn a living, support their families uh, up until the time that they were injured. Often they're the heads of the families. They contribute to food production. They're women who raise children, care for sick and elderly, and are leaders of life in their towns. Um, so our strategy involves community engagement, encouraging better education about the risks and how to avoid and prevent snake bite, but also how to, how to look at the issue of healthcare seeking behaviour and trying to empower these communities in a more holistic approach that integrates snake bite awareness, not just as a standalone siloed program, but integrates it into broader programs that approach communities about all sorts of other environmental, zoonotic and, and neglected diseases. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and briefly before we flip to the one after this, um, this emphasises prevention, risk reduction and avoidance, issues like the use of bed nets as effective barriers, but it also deals with improving effective pre-hospital care and ambulance transport. And I know that people are fixated with snake bite ambulances. And look, I founded a, a snake bite ambulance service in Papua New Guinea. We set up and ran the country's first mobile intensive care ambulance, specifically to be able to retrieve the worst of the worst patients, patients with airway emergencies that would have cost them their lives during referral to hospital from a primary or secondary health centre. And that's all great in principle, but what do you do when that ambulance gets to a health centre and they find that not only is there a critically ill snake bite patient, but there's a, a woman there who's hemorrhaging in the eighth month of pregnancy. Do you only use that ambulance to save the life of the snake bite patient? Or do you take the other patient as well? And this, to me, is really important. We don't just need snake bite ambulances. We need ambulances for everyone. But we need to make sure that those ambulance services are better 
able to deal with the management of snake bite patients that they're transporting. Um, we need to develop good pre-hospital clinical care guidelines. We need to accelerate the development of new hospital pre-hospital treatments and validate uh, existing approaches and conduct operational research um, and increased advocacy to, to really drive some of these messages home to the people who need to hear them the most. So we'll go to the next slide. And it really is all about this, this fundamental issue of how do we make sure that people who need um, treatment get it as soon as possible. We know that between 50 and 90% of snake bite victims in countries turn to traditional medicine. Um, it contributes to the underreporting of snake bite. We need to work with these communities and, and do it in a longitudinal manner to evaluate and modify and amend the interventions that we're talking about to see whether we're actually reaching desired outcomes um, and build a, a consultation, consultative approach. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is this approach of people parachuting into a, a particular setting. Um, and as a white person, I must say, this is a particular danger. You run the risk of going into a community and being a know-it-all that people will just tell you what you want to hear. You need to establish relationships with people. You need to gain their trust and their respect and you need to actively listen to what they have to say rather than just um, parachuting in and hoping to get back out as quickly as you can with some sort of nugget of information. So this is really a part of WHO's program that is sensitive to, to really listening to communities. We'll go to the next slide. And this brings us to, I guess, the thing that is really important about treatment and treatment must be safe and effective. If we can go past this slide to the main body of this section, uh, there's a few things here that I want to talk about. Yep, next, that's it, okay. So this is going to require a fairly large investment from WHO, almost 50 million US dollars. Um, it's really critical that antivenoms are well designed and formulated and adhere to the right international standards. We know in sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia that safe, effective products are lacking. If you're having to give somebody 40 vials of antivenom, I'll tell you right now, that antivenom is rubbish. It's not effective. You shouldn't be having to give them 400 millilitres of a, of a product to, to get some sort of a clinical response. Antivenoms need to be designed properly. They need to be fit for use. The, the whole problem with this multivial strategy we have at the moment is that people end up being systematically underdosed. Um, I hear all the time people here in sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm in Africa at the moment, saying that antivenoms are not effective for spitting cobras. Um, and that people continue to progress with local tissue injury from puff adders. But then you find out that there are places where they're giving large doses of effective antivenom, and surprise, surprise, those people are going home with minimal local tissue injury because they're getting an adequate therapeutic dose early after they were bitten. Um, so it's very important that there needs to be urgent strategic investment to both improve and strengthen production, the, improve the control and regulation of antivenom products. Um, otherwise, we're going to see far more products that are ineffective, and we're going to see countries undergoing shortages of safe, effective, accessible, and affordable products. If we go to the next slide, and while I'm talking, we can sort of roll through these. Um, one of the really important things to do is to prioritise current products. I know there's a lot of talk about the next generation of antivenoms, but in terms of research priorities, we cannot ignore what products are in the market now, because at least for the next five to 10 years, they're the only therapeutic options most people are going to have. Um, people talk about the problems with antivenom production at the moment. The reality is, most manufacturers do not make enough money to have an R&D division. They don't make enough money 
to modernise equipment and facilities to bring it up from the level of the 1930s or 40s to the 2020s. Um, it is a, an area that has been systematically neglected and there is a huge disconnect between the directions that researchers are going in and the research that needs to be undertaken at an operational level to help manufacturers undergo, undergo um, improvements to functional problems. And that disconnect needs to be redressed. It's very important that we do that. At the same time, we need to have better control and regulation of products. We have to stop seeing products being marketed that have never gone through even preclinical testing, let alone robust, well-designed clinical trials. And I agree very strongly with David Worrell that unless a product has been subjected to clinical trials, we really should think twice about whether or not it's given um, market authorization. We go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the other side of this coin is that it's not just good enough to have good quality products. We have to improve the level of training and education of health workers as well. If we don't do that, it's, there's no point having a good product out in a market if nobody is able to use it effectively. So it's really important that we address that situation. So WHO's priority is not just on the products themselves, it's also on the training of health workers, getting more and more focus on snake bite education into medical curricula and improving things like clinical decision making, making treatment recovery and rehabilitation, having standard uh, objective clinical criteria to recognize envenoming syndromes, developing frameworks for point of care diagnostics, um, post-acute phase treatment as part of the clinical pathway, um, and the most important thing of all, I think, is the fact that we've always neglected rehabilitation and embracing the need to get rehabilitation care workers involved uh, in the necessary aftercare that's required by people who are disabled. The slide you're looking at at the moment deals with market vulnerability. And this is something that's not just unique to sub-Saharan Africa, although you can see at the top left, one of the big problems Africa has is that it doesn't have manufacturers of antivenom. Apart from uh, Algeria and Egypt uh, and South Africa and Morocco, there's no local production of products. And that's a, a major bottleneck in terms of increasing the number of manufacturers by around 25% in the next 10 years. I think it's very important that we increase them in the countries that are close to where the problems occur. Um, because we have to break this current cycle that we have um, where we have lack of products to support procurement, low confidence in the safety of products, driving a cycle that ends up in decreased production and rising anti-venom cost. If we go to the next slide. I just want to briefly talk about some of the things that WHO is doing in this regard. Um, we have begun by undertaking risk benefit assessments of current antivenoms. We've already done this for sub-Saharan Africa, um, and we are planning to do this for parts of um, the Middle East, for the Sierra region, which will include uh, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, um, Sri Lanka um, next year and the year after before we move into Southeast Asia um, in 2022. We are building support for regulators, addressing some of their weaknesses to improve regulation. We're also looking at how we can provide better technical support for manufacturers. We have a set of guidelines on the manufacturing of antivenoms and they will undergo a third revision next year and the, the production of a third edition. Um, but also we need to sort of slowly, I guess, bring manufacturers up to speed with the new technologies that are available, help them to integrate new technology into their manufacturing, um, both in terms of production and in quality control uh, of products. And of course, this will eventually prepare them for the day when we do have second generation and potentially 
even third generation products become available. Um, but the other area we're looking at is the development of revolving anti-venom stockpiles that are donor seeded and then eventually sustained by government procurement to reinvigorate and produce sustainable anti-venom markets. And this is all aimed at ending that current vicious cycle that I showed you on the previous slide. We go to the next slide in this list, uh, the assessment of products. I just wanna give you a little bit of an example. This is a very robust process. It involves three stages, a formal dossier review by a committee of international experts, independent laboratory testing of products, and GMP site inspections and manufacturing premises. Now in Sub-Saharan Africa, we got nine initial applications. Two of them we ended up eliminating very quickly because the products were not suited for Sub-Saharan Africa. They were products for the Middle East. We rejected two other applications because of problems with information contained in the dossiers. Um, of the five remaining, one of them has already been recommended. Uh, a monovalent product for African carpet vipers manufactured by the company Microfarm. And we've just finished finalising assessments for four other products um, following GMP corrective and preventative actions, um, CAPA uh, analyses and some final laboratory testing. And those manufacturers will be being notified of the results in the next couple of weeks. Next slide. Okay, so I won't dwell on this, but the GMP um, side of manufacturing is critically important. Um, and it is part of this, this assessment process. So we'll move on to the next slide and I'll leave that for you to look at yourselves later on because we wanna talk about this idea of stockpiling. And as an example in say East Africa, this may mean that we take a product that's suitable for all of these countries it has a common procurement pathway. So a manufacturer is only dealing with one purchaser. The manufacturers know that a certain amount is required every year so that they know what sort of income they're going to have. They can plan. Um, it means that they've got the ability to look at their finances, work out how they're going to sustain that production, how they're going to improve the capacity of their production. Um, that product goes in through that common pathway into all the countries to ensure that their needs are met and it's complemented by the community engagement, the improved healthware education and training, monitoring of the market with surveillance and pharmacovigilance, which feedbacks reports of adverse reactions to the manufacturers so that they can make improvements. And this all follows the sort of approach that's been used, for example, with the oral cholera vaccines um, to basically stabilise and, and get a market moving again um, and give everybody some faith that the products they're using are safe and effective, um, give the manufacturers some faith in the fact that they're, they're actually going to eventually get paid for the products they supply. Um, and everybody then has the confidence needed to, to actually move ahead with, with some degree of certainty. Next slide. Okay, so the other thing about dealing with snake bite problems, we have to look at the bigger picture as well. We have to look at having stronger health systems because only if all of the parts of a health system are properly functioning, are you going to be able to meet the needs of a snake bite victim. And this means from that primary response at the village level through to the procurement process for drugs, antivenoms, consumables for hospitals, the competency of health workers, um, the monitoring and evaluation processes, the broader policy aspects. So if we go to the next slide, um, it means we have to have a functional system. So WHO wants to, to put a, a reasonably large amount of money again into doing this. And it involves things like surveillance and monitoring as well, um, improving in infrastructure, services and health facilities, um, and facilitating research on things like the ecology, epidemiology, and clinical outcomes and therapeutics for snake bite envenoming, as well as focusing on community health services and um, facilitating research and policy to mitigate the costs of healthcare, 
uh, in populations that are vulnerable to, to those sorts of issues. So it's all about basically having a health system that can achieve sustainable development goals and provide universal health coverage that has the, the robust surveillance and reporting necessary, has the regulatory and policy frameworks, has staff that know how to use these uh, products when they are available, um, and make sure that people are not left out by their inability to cover cost, um, not just of antivenom, but the cost of hospitalisation, the cost of rehabilitation, and the loss of income as a result of injury. So we go to the next slide. And again, these are things I've talked about, so we'll just keep flipping forward, please. And yes, if we can keep going, I want to get to a slide on research priorities. Yep, under partnerships, this is their fourth pillar. So we want to invest in partnerships. WHO can't do this alone. It can't do this just in concert with the countries either. We need to involve development partners, donors, industry, academia, all sorts of other stakeholders in affecting the necessary change that has to happen. Um, we have to have a strong investment case for the strategy. We have to show donors the need because when donors are looking at putting money into a project, they will look at where they're going to get the best bang for buck. And I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the cold, harsh reality of life. If you have to choose between putting a uh, million dollars into one of 10 different diseases, you're going to choose the one where you're going to get the most benefit for the most people for the amount of money that you've got to invest. So if we want to make snakebite a competitive um, global good in terms of what people are going to put their money into, we have to have good governance and leadership. We have to promote the right sort of communication and engagement um, and integration, coordination, cooperation needed to be able to show that. Um, so it all has to be put together as a, a package that involves lots of different players. And if we can keep going just to the next slide, I think we're getting close towards... Uh, keep going. One more slide over, if you don't mind. Okay, so this is the first of the research priorities, and I think this will interest a lot of you guys. We think it's necessary across all four of these pillars to involve um, the research community. At community level, we need baseline studies within communities of knowledge, perceptions, and understanding of snake bite. We need research on effective first aid interventions and risk management. Please do not teach pressure immobilisation bandaging, um, an Australian methodology for um, a lapid snakes that do not cause local tissue injury to, to countries in South Asia. Because the problem is, even if you tell them to only use it for a crate bite, it will get used for lots of other things. And used inappropriately, it can cause injury to those people over and above the injury of the snake bite itself. Um, but also, there's not that much evidence, to be perfectly honest, that it's even an effective method of first aid. So the whole question of snake bite first aid needs to be fundamentally readdressed. We need to go back to the start and we need to look at what works and what doesn't. And at the end of the day, it may be that simple immobilisation and rapid transport with attention to A, B, C, D, E is what we should be focused on rather than gimmicks like bandages and, and fancy splints uh, and things like that. Although I certainly think there's some potential for pre-hospital therapeutic interventions, um, things like so blarisplodip, which may eventually get to clinical trials, um, are something that we should potentially con consider in that arsenal of first aid interventions. In things like health systems research, epidemiological research to better understand the burden, and not just in a hospital setting, but in a community setting. The types of studies that have been done, such as the million death study in India, uh, are exactly the approach that we should be taking across more and more jurisdictions. But we also need to integrate geospatial analysis. We need to identify high risk and vulnerable populations. Um, for health systems, we need to evaluate interventions uh, to remove barriers to effective access to treatment, 
Um, we need to look at access to healthcare services. And WHO has a, a, an application called Access Mod, which is really useful for this. It looks at things like time and distance. It looks at the type of transport infrastructure, the types of terrain that people have to cover to get to a health facility. And it takes into account which facilities actually have the resources needed to treat the patient. And it can enable you to say at a, um, an ambulance service intervention level, for example, plan which are the best pathways for getting people rapidly from the point where they were injured to the most uh, relevant and effective and functional health facility where they can gain rapid access to, to effective treatment. We'll go to the next slide. Um, in terms of antivenoms, we need some basic things as well as all this high level stuff about next generation recombinant monoclonal um, you know products we need basic operational research on antivenom availability where is it available in your country what's the actual demand for it how affordable is it and how cost effective is it you would be amazed at how little information we have in this realm the amount of economic research on antivenom financing and patient cost mitigation, I could fit onto the head of a match. These are critical areas that we need to address. We also need, as I said before, to integrate research between industry and academia. We need to strengthen, innovate, improve and expand the production quality control and preclinical and clinical testing of the products we're working with now not to the exclusion of next generation products because we need to invest in those as well. But if we put all of our eggs into one future basket and we ignore the, the needs that we have right at this minute, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are going to die unnecessarily. In terms of medical care and recovery, we have to look at where can we conduct sentinel clinical research where can we find enough patients bitten by a particular species of snake to be able to rapidly do an effectively powered clinical trial to demonstrate whether an antivenom that's in the market is effective or not, whether it's safe or not. And we have to think about that sort of clinical research pragmatically. You know, there's a lot of interest in the design of uh, very elaborate clinical trials, but the reality is, can we actually carry them out in the types of clinical settings where people first present after a snake bite? And if the answer is no, we can't, then we need to be thinking about how we can come up with uh, a simple approach that establishes the safety of a product and the effective dose of a product, and then provides a monitoring and surveillance pathway to introduce that product and evaluate it over time in say, something like a phase four design but we have to think about these things. Um, we'll go to the final couple of slides because I know I'm probably close to being over time and getting yanked off stage. There's information here about the total budget and what the needs are and how WHO want to prioritise it. I'll let you all take a look at that. We'll go to the next one. Um, this is something that's also very important for people to think about. We have to stop thinking about snake bite in a siloed context. We have to look at synergies with other diseases. And in this case, I've given an example of other NTDs, how we can do it with bed nets. And Sanjeev has given great examples of how bed nets can prevent crate bites in Nepal. But protective footwear um, needed to deal with soil transmitted helminths, podoconiosis, and other types of NTDs, they can also effectively prevent snake bite in the first place. Wound care, how can we cooperate and collaborate with people who are doing work on say, rabies or lymphedema or burns um, or brulee ulcer to improve the treatment of local wounds after snake bites. Um, this whole issue of stockpiling and then wash. And I know people will go, well, what the hell has, you know, sanitation got to do with preventing snake bite? think back to how many men women and children get bitten because they step outside at night to use a bush latrine or how many women and girls get bitten walking to a river to get water to wash or drink 
if we can improve sanitation, if we can improve access to clean drinking water, we can also prevent snake bites. And think about community and health worker education and training, and not just doing lots and lots of stacked silo type programs and campaigns. Let's think about addressing the need for community and health worker education more holistically in terms of all of the challenges that people face. Next slide, and let's wrap this up. This is really an opportunity to change the status quo. I would like to think that this conference will use the momentum it creates to look at improving political recognition and support to create a plan of action in the scientific and medical communities. It would be good, and I've said this at other meetings I've been to, that meetings should look to producing clear communiques that emerge supporting the global effort to prevent and control snake bite envenoming, and that the scientific community has to get involved in the implementation of WHO's roadmap by looking at the research priorities we've identified and how you can align with those, and then implementing projects and developing solutions and coming up with outputs and outcomes. So I'll finish there. Um, I think the last slide is just a, a graphic. Um, if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to field them. And uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David Williams, for that very comprehensive kind of uh, presentation, giving a complete overview of what uh, should be done and what the WHO is doing and uh, what is the situation in various parts of the world. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, got some sort of an idea as to the you know, uh, magnitude of this uh, problem that is taking uh, humankind for a long time. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are a couple of questions, maybe we can squeeze those in. And uh, there are a lot of uh, congratulatory messages for uh, Dr. David, uh, aside from a few questions, I think I'll hand over the stage to Dr. Jaydeep Menon to make his closing uh, remarks. Wonderful talk there, Dr. David. You've given us a roadmap of what the way ahead is like. Uh, thanks a lot. And with this, we come to the end of the conference. The three days have actually been a good learning curve, I guess, for most of us. And what uh, you know, what the, the, the major takeaway really is that snake bite still evinces so much of interest from so many, of, so so many of you all, and there are a lot of students who have shown a lot of interest in this. We still have so many people logged on. It's now three hours, three hours in front of a of a screen is really difficult. It's not like a virtual conference. I hope all of us keep this interest going, and we're able to meet physically next year. And in the meanwhile, we continue to do, do the work that so interests us. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful these three days, and I hope that there's much more to be presented next year when we meet physically, wherever it will be. What we've done is we've unmuted a few of you all. If there's anything that anyone would like to add, please do so. You could just unmute yourself and speak. Well, can I just say a, a word of congratulation to the organizers? I think this is, we'd all agree this has been a most rewarding uh, three day meeting. Uh, I suppose the frustration, of course, of meeting like this is that there are many loose ends. Many questions have been left unanswered. Uh, many important issues are still floating in the air without a proper resolution. And uh, that is, again, as one of the advantages of a face-to-face -face meeting. At least you can find the speaker afterwards and continue the discussion. But I think it's, uh, for me, it's been a most rewarding experience. I've learned a great deal, and I hope that I've been able to make some new contacts uh, in, the, um, in the circle of uh, Indian snake bite and snake and snake venom experts. So thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's actually the quality of the speakers that brought everything to this conference. We had an excellent list of speakers, and therein is therein lay the success of the conference. Awesome.
Anybody else wants to add something, Dr. Joseph? Organizing president. Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Jaideep and uh, Dr. Joseph, for giving us the great opportunity. It was really a uh, very enriching in, uh, uh, opportunity to know about the Indian uh, snake.